Governor John Engler, it's great to see you again. I want to ask you an opening question. Who were the Englers? <laughs> well, the Englers were a family in central Michigan, uh, Beale City in Isabella County uh, was sort of where they settled. Uh, in the 19th century? Yeah, it would be, um, you know, my great, would be a great grandfather, I think would have been the sort of patriarch at least that started that farming area. We always wondered why they didn't go to the Saginaw Valley where the land was a lot better and more productive. Uh, instead, we had a lot of clay and a lot of stones to pick as kids growing up. But uh, actually, I grew up, uh, it's called Engler Brothers because there were two grand, my grandfather and his brother were the uh, two operators of the Engler Farms. And then they each had a son, my dad and his first cousin. And then when those uh, gentlemen became of age, uh, Francis wanted to go in the dairy business. My dad wanted to be in the beef cattle business. And so they actually divided up the farm. And so there was, uh, Matt Engler had his beef cattle operation. They switched barns. Actually, the cows went uh, across the other <laughs> barn and the beef cattle uh, was where we were living. And uh, that's where I grew up. And uh, we uh, are still there now. The farm is all united under a, a son of my, uh, not our family, the three boys, none of them farmed. Yeah. Uh, the other family had his son and he is farming, although he's now a, been a county commissioner for a lot of years and there's no, no dairy cattle there anymore and there's no real cattle on the farm, so it's just a cropping operation. But uh, it's interesting, agriculture has changed dramatically. Uh, when I went to Beale City High School, there were I think 42 kids in our class and I'll bet 30 of them probably were on farms. Uh, operating farms, even if the f father maybe worked somewhere else, but most of them were full-time farming operations. Today, I'll bet there aren't three farmers that operate all that land and farm all that land. So wow. it's the mechanization changed big time. Do you know where in Germany the Anglers came from? Uh, I don't actually, I, I should know more of this. Uh, Was it like Bavaria? They would have been the Bavarian area. Yeah. Uh, the um, My mother's side is all, Austria and my father, uh, there were, we actually had this fascinating thing where that grandfather and his brother each married sisters. So you had these double cousins all the way down, but the cousins were Irish. So you had the, the German side from Engler and the O'Brien side from the Irish side. So I have that German, Irish, and then my mother's side was all Austrian and they came over from uh, the Bregenz area, Bowdoin Sea, uh, yeah. not too far from the German border, but uh, oh, okay. they, they came over. In fact, one of her sisters, actually, they came, uh, uh, Jacob Nye, or the, uh, her father, came over, went back. One of the sisters was actually born her, in that generation in Austria, but then came back, was brought back as a child. So, uh, and and that, that family was pretty, the Nye family yeah. was pretty large. One of the interesting things is there's actually uh, a Nyer going to win a house seat up in central Michigan, mm -hmm. a guy named Jerry Nyer. Jerry's uh, uh, grandfather would be a brother to my mother. No and so, kidding. Wow. Yeah, so there's a shirt tail relationship Wow, there. that's interesting. Well, Roman Catholic probably on both yeah, sides the, of the, the family. The community was, was predominantly Catholic and uh, both on the Irish, you know, there were there were Irish families and, and then predominantly German. I mean, you had a community full of Schmitz, Schaefer's, Schumacher's, Pungs, Gross, I mean, all of those names and uh, a number of them. Uh, and I think, you know, to some extent, even maybe in my family, you know, came over in the Powamo Westphalia area just outside Lansing. A lot of people right. came through that Westphalia area and then, and then came up north. So some of those names, Thielens, uh, uh, are in both places. There are a lot of names that are kind of shared uh, among those two communities and so in the old days when a fowler beale city matchup occurred you'd have some similar names on both sides of that uh, football field or basketball court <laughs> now your father matt engler uh he not only was a beef feeder but uh, wasn't he really prominent? Uh, wasn't he like president of the Michigan Beef Feeders right. Association? Right, there was a Michigan Cattlemen's Association yeah. that he uh, and one of his very good, good close friends, a guy named Milt Brown, uh, kind of were, were leaders in that. Um, and then for a while, uh, he actually, when he was sort of 
wrapping up the farming, uh, actually kind of represented them in Lansing. Uh, and there was a, uh, a beef commission that was set up actually legislation I sponsored uh, in the, my early days in the House of Representatives, but uh, that was to help the beef industry. And that represented not only the people who were raising cattle, but it was also the marketing side. So, uh, and the whole idea was just to kind of have that industry explained and some of the issues they were beginning to deal with. And as these operations got larger in scope, um, there were you know, there were lots of you know things that they dealt with. And so, he really enjoyed that. He he went to, he did not go to college. He came to Michigan State University and completed a short course. He always had had wanted to go to college, but uh, it, it didn't work out. Uh, uh, his timing wasn't perfect on that. He was born in 23, and so by the time he's, he graduated from high school early, I think he was done at 16 in high school, so he did this short course, but he never, he was an only son, an only child, actually. And, oh. and, really couldn't get away and then there was a world war he wasn't uh, drafted because he was working on the farm but uh, he never had a chance really but he was always a voracious reader and very interested in government and community affairs had spent probably 20 years on the Beale City School Board probably uh, most notable about that aspect of his life was that uh, he and his colleagues on that board, it was an interesting school board because there were always probably on that public school board, uh, six of the seven were Catholic, but but they always made sure there was somebody who wasn't Catholic to be <laughs> on the board, the public school, you know, and mm -hmm. and they had very good relationship with the local parish, and uh, it, it worked out quite well. Uh, and in those days, there was a parochial elementary school, so you you would have this situation where there were about three rooms for the uh, pre. Uh, high school, you know, kids uh, in the public system, but then everybody went from the parochial school to the public high school. And uh, the the uh, school board, though, resisted the pressure that was pretty uh, prominent in the early 60s to consolidate all these school districts. Right. And they would not uh, absolutely refuse to do that, didn't want to give up the local school. Mm -hmm. Later on, it, it's interesting because... Uh, when we started to reform uh, education and create a lot more choices and options, school choice, public school choice, became part of the law in Michigan. And suddenly, all of these students who were in the neighboring school districts, there was one that was consolidated called Chippewa Hills, and it took mm -hmm. in Wademan, Barrington, uh, Remus. These were all individual school districts. Now suddenly they're in one district, but they kind of wrapped all the way around Beale City, but a lot of these kids were very close to the Beale City schools, buses going by their house, you know, but they couldn't get on those buses. Well, now all of a sudden it changed and a whole a host of these kids came over to Beale City and have ever since gone there. And so it's, wow. it's, it's, it's an interesting, um, I, I suppose, history only in the sense that it, it I suppose, it, whether consciously or not, informed some of my thinking about the idea that really... Uh, you know, students and parents ought to have choices about where they go to school. Right. Accidents of geography uh, shouldn't just be what dictates or one's wealth right. and the ability to buy that home. Right, absolutely. Now, your mother and father had uh, a number of children in addition to you, John Engler. How many brothers and sisters <laughs> well, did you have? Well, after me uh, were two brothers and four sisters, and okay. they're still all living in Michigan. I used to, uh, you know, during the COVID uh uh, the pandemic, I would talk about uh, Michelle's, you know, I married Michelle from San Antonio, and so we're back there after 30 years of her being up north. She she wanted to be home with her parents, and uh, especially her mother had had a stroke and had, you know, some health issues the last several years of her life, and she passed away in, in 2021. So when... Uh, we got back there, but COVID and everybody's kind of locked down. You know, Texas opened up much, much earlier. Uh, schools were open, the communities were open, and Michigan was sort of locked under house arrest up here. It was quite a quite a stark difference, and in, mm -hmm. in, uh, I would say they were the brothers and sisters a little envious of the freedom we had in Texas. <laughs> 
Well, now in 1968, if I remember correctly, your father decided he's going to run for the state house of representatives. Yeah, he got talked into it. Some people came, and uh, you know, and I was in I was at Michigan State at the time. Uh, he'd never really been active in uh, a political party. I mean, the school boards are nonpartisan elections, so, right? And, and he had never uh, he'd never really, you know, I guess he spent a term or two maybe on the county commission, but but he was mostly school board stuff, and, and they talked him into running. Against it, an incumbent. Against Russell Strange, Russell who had Strange. been, uh, in, in the historical footnote there's interesting, because Russell Strange in 1956 is elected to the House of Representatives, at the time the youngest person ever to be elected to the Michigan House, and he had a September birthday. Oh, that comes into play a little bit later on, but Russ had been there for, you know, all of those years, twelve in, in years. that case, uh, 12 years, I guess, uh, in 68. At the same time, people were talking to my dad about running down in Montcalm County, and the district was two counties, was Isabella and Montcalm. Those days, they paid a little more attention to county boundaries and communities <laughs> of interest, but uh, that's kind of all gone by the boards, too. But in Montcalm County, they're talking to the mayor of Greenville, a guy named Lloyd Walker, and they talked Lloyd into running. So you've got Lloyd running in Montcalm County, my father running in Isabel County, and Russ Strange, the incumbent. As it turns out, uh, both the challengers won their respective counties, but Strange uh, was second in both and had enough votes to be renominated and easily win re-election. I, in those Were you cases, involved in that campaign? Uh, a little bit, because I, w I was home that summer, and because um, I, I was always working, but, but, you know, I, well, what can I do to help? And so I went out, I tried to do some scheduling. I'd never done any of that stuff and tried to uh, figure out what might make a difference. I didn't know anything about politics, but, uh, or campaigns really, but it was completely chaotic and disorganized. And, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't know anything, but I knew that didn't seem to be working very well. <laughs> and these campaigns only are about a month long. So it really kind of, you, you know, at fourth, fourth of July rolls around, okay, better have a campaign. Well, what are mm -hmm. you going to do? And uh, I remember setting up meetings and, you know, having my dad go places. And, you know, we, there was a brochure, so I'd hand out brochures or a bumper sticker here and there. Uh, anyway, he, he loses, but I was so intrigued, I guess. I, I was an ag econ major at Michigan State, but that gave me a fair bit of flexibility in other courses. And so I actually put, took a political science, a couple of political science courses. And one was on Michigan government. And for the project, uh, one of my buddies, uh, we, we were in the class together. So we wrote this paper on how uh, you should run a campaign, how you could beat this incumbent, this guy named Russ Strange. And... Uh, there was a county treasurer at the time, good friend of the family, uh, good guy, and I thought he was going to run. It was always some talk about Ron Demlo being the, mm -hmm. you know, how to run for the legislature because he was a real smart man. And but as it turned out, he he didn't want to do this. We're now fast forwarding to 1970, so I'm supposed to be finishing up at Michigan State. We've got this <laughs> blueprint, and uh, that blueprint, Ron doesn't want to run. And I said, well. I think this will work. Maybe I'll run. And uh, what'd your father say about that? I think he was more than a little surprised. Uh, <laughs> and and I kind of was. Well, I've got nothing to lose, and and why not? But we took our little blueprint, and um, interestingly enough, I think it was my dad who said, "You know, you ought to meet this guy, Dick Postumus. I was at the state FFA convention. He's the FFA president." And he's a pretty sharp guy. He was over in Kent County. Yeah, in Caledonia. Yeah. Now, oddly enough, with Dick, he and I had, had an encounter earlier. When I was a senior in high school, Dick was a sophomore. And we were both active in FFA. He, he, he rose to great heights. I was merely <laughs> somebody who was active. But as it turned out, we both were in charge of, uh, we both had parliamentary procedure teams. That was one of the leadership contests that the FFA had. And, uh, and Beale City lost to Caledonia in the regional finals in a oh. disputed uh, uh, contest because mm -hmm. the, the timekeeper had a stopwatch and he thought the 32nd hand <laughs> was a minute. Uh, 
<laughs> and so he had the timing wrong, and we knew he was wrong, so we ignored that and, and did our, you mm. know, demonstrated our proficiency. But the judges, I always told Dick, you know, he had homers, you know, they were, <laughs> yeah. So they gave Caledonia the gold medal at first place. We got a gold medal, but not first place. They went on then and were the state champions oh in this. Oh, my God. And, uh, He's probably never let you forget that. No, and I don't let him forget it, you know, so it was very funny. So, I mean, but we didn't, we didn't really know each other well, but we, yeah. we obviously we had this, uh, with this encounter. But then I talked to him, it turned out he was actually living in Shaw Hall, where I was, and so I said, you know, why don't you, uh, it's probably something you never thought about, but you ought to come and, you know, would you be interested in helping on this campaign? So here's Dick milking cows in Caledonia in the morning on their little farm, and then he would drive up. You know, damn near an hour drive to get up there and he'd help the campaign so he was the campaign manager and uh or became the campaign manager and we won that primary by 162 votes and i i think we spent about four thousand dollars or something on that at Can the time imagine? yeah and, and i think uh i don't know if my grandmother somebody had there was a little tiny uh insurance policy was worth thousand dollars and we cashed that in so that was some of our money, and, and I remember the first $100 check we got, which is a big deal, you know, and, and I think that was the largest check we got from anybody, but we got a few of those and a few other $20 here and $30 there, but won that primary. And you pulled off the shocking upset. I mean, Yeah, well, here we are. Russ Strange is the caucus chairman. He's been there 14 years, completely solid and safe. Now, I mean, in, in fairness to Russ, he... He also, he, he'd gotten in some kind of a, I think it was a boating accident or something. He, he kind of threw his back out. And so he kind of laid up, couldn't campaign. Probably, I think, also thought he had no no real worry here. Uh, yeah. And part of the strategy is you had to have one-on-one. -on -one. You had to have, you, you didn't want to split any of the right. opposition to the long-term incumbent. You want to get all that. And uh, anyway, by 162 votes, I think, was the margin in that race. And you know, these townships would come in and you'd win one, you know, 40 to 37 or something. Yeah, well, yeah. You know, and I remember a farmer, a guy named Bob Hafer, a good friend of the family, he, he could, well, more pluses and minuses, you know, while well, they added up. <laughs> anyway, we got there. And I will say to, to Russ's great credit, after that was over, he was unbelievably gracious. He uh, offered to have me come with him down to Lansing, introduced me to a bunch of people and you know, so here I am, and and now I'm 21. At the time I turned 22 in October. Now the significance of that is my birthday was a month later than his. So not only did he lose his seat, he lost his record. Yeah, in yeah. The same, yeah. Same election. Exactly. And so that's how it all started. And um, right. Well, it was a Republican district, so you all of a sudden find yourself in the Michigan House of Representatives. Yep. Uh, so first you know, person I hired was Carol Morey. At right. the time, who becomes sure. later Carol Bavente, but yeah, uh, and Carol, a lifelong friend. Uh, I figured I'm going to make a lot of mistakes when we get somebody who's going to be here with me. Who, uh, you know, uh, there was such a network down there. I didn't want one of the the veterans. <laughs> Every time I screwed up something, <laughs> everybody in the building would know it. At least Carol and I could make these mistakes and right, you know, kind of stay quiet. It was, it was interesting. Um, another history of repeating itself. I'm paired uh, in the office. In those days, you all shared an office, and, and they didn't have nearly as much staff as is around now. But I was uh, put in with a first-term lawmaker because that's first-term people stared off as other first-term people. My office mate was a guy named Richard Frisky from uh, oh boy, whoa, <laughs> up, up in northern Michigan. Wow, well, you Frisky Orchards. Gotta just mentioned something about. Yeah, Frisky. well, I, I mentioned him because his actual son is going to be in the legislature come right. uh, January of uh, 2023. Uh, years ago, and I, I, in, I met the son at a function, oh, some weeks back, and I, and I explained him. He didn't know that I had been the office mate with his dad, and and we always laugh because his dad was he was a character he. Pretty staunch conservative, but but in his campaign, he campaigned as a veteran of World War II. <laughs> what he didn't mention, he was in the Luftwaffe. Because <laughs> he, was, a, he was in the German. He was uh, a real German. Yeah, he was. He, he, First, he, yeah. He, he came here as a POW. Right. Uh, exactly. And then stayed and, uh, and built a life. And uh, 
he was only there a term, but he was. Uh, did you feel you learned anything from him, or no? We, I mean, we had a cordial relationship, and we're we're sitting about as close as we're sitting. Our yeah. desks are side by side yeah. inside a little office, and yeah. in those days, uh, the capital had been chopped up into pieces by yeah, uh, really by Charlie Zoller and Garlene primarily because yeah. reconstruction always, of the yeah yeah. Well, I think there was a whole idea of maybe we get a new capital here at some point because yeah. there was yeah. kind of that movement at yeah. the time later on. I play a little bit of a role in helping to restore the capital, but um, I was on one of those overfloor offices, and so no, it, it, you know, uh, Representative Frisky and I, we, you know, cordial. You're, you're always you're cordial, right. and 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 you you, you realize I think uh, quickly that there's there's 110 members in the House, so you've got all kinds of personalities, all kinds of backgrounds. It's a real melting pot of people and thinking and. Uh, personalities so uh no it, it, it was fine and uh, mm. from from there um you know redistricting looming in 1970 and 72 the district's completely different not completely different yeah. but well okay so you're in the legislature and then right away here in your first term you're confronted with uh re-election in a new district Right. And as I remember it, you ended up having to run against a fellow state representative, right? Right. And yep. Dick so, Allen. Yeah. So and, and tell us about that. Well, uh, you know, Dick was from a legislative family. His father, Lester Allen, had been in the legislature. So there was a, he was a bit of a, it was a legacy also. Right. So the right. Allen name and, and their Gratiot County family were an Isabella County family. What happened, though, in the drawing of the map, it was Isabella County, part of Gratiot, and part of Montcalm. Well, I had, for two years at least, represented Montcalm and Isabella, never had represented Gratiot. And we looked at that, we said, well, Dick's gonna win Gratiot, that's home base for him, I'm probably gonna win Isabella, better fight this out in Montcalm. And that was our strategy, and I think by, now that was a 700 vote win or something, but uh, we always felt very comfortable that the, the math sort of favored us, and if we, <clears throat> ran a good campaign. It was interesting, one of the issues in that campaign, uh, this is 1972, so it's pre Roe v. Wade. Right. There was a, a pretty significant debate about abortion, and Dick had been, the Dick was a veterinarian, uh, but in a Michigan State guy as well, but uh, Dick had been the sponsor of the uh, liberalization of the abortion law. Yeah, that was on the session. ballot too, as a ballot proposal. Uh, it was. Year. Uh, yeah. I, I, and I believe it was on in seventy two. It was on well. in seventy two so, by petition of the people that's who right. wanted to liberalize the law. That's right. And uh, so that that failed, and Dick was, I think, widely viewed as a as a leading proponent. Right. As was and and, and very close at the time with the Millican, uh, well, well, certainly with Governor Millican himself, but also sort of the, I don't want to call it wing of the party, but the... The, the, the pro-choice cho faction of the yeah, Republican that, Party. Yeah, that would be a yeah. good way to say it. I mean, because yeah. there, there was, and the other guy that was very close to Dick, uh, very prominent in the Republican Party in those days, a guy named Dr. Jack Stack, who right. was in Gratiot County, right. and, and Jack was one of the leading, as a, as a medical doctor was one of the leading proponents of the uh, uh, liberalization of the abortion law. And so that issue became a... Well, there was a heavy pro-life constituency in that district, wasn't there really? Well, there what was. What we would call I mean, pro-life now. Yeah. Um, were against abortion. Yeah, I, I had, I had a, a pro-life perspective that I uh, was very comfortable with and, and, and consistent throughout really by... Right career in elective office right. um, it and and there's no question that there there was uh, that played a role in that I right. mean I, places like Montcalm maybe not as much but certainly in parishes like you know Mount Pleasant had Sacred Heart Parish right, right. Big parish and sure. probably that that was more of a I would say a constituent be a little more prone to ticket splitting anyway for a general election but as it turned out, we had a lot of support in the primary because right. they came out to right. support me. Uh, and even in Alma, uh, which is in Gratiot County, there were a couple of 
you know, there was some, you know, there was some support there that probably wouldn't have been there but for that issue. Right, right, so, right. Uh, yeah, it was, you know, one thing I should mention, you, we talk about Russell Strange, you probably talk about, you know, Beale City in the in the race against Strange, I'll never forget this, Nottawa Township, which is Beale City, I think we won one of those precincts 165 to 4 or something. <laughs> it, was, it was an amazing vote. <laughs> we always joked about who were the four votes, but uh, that was clearly in the in those early that days. That was also almost the margin of victory overall right in that right race. in that one one township just Ottawa township one, probably unbelievable yeah. yeah there would have been I, I would guess in Ottawa township alone would have provided a margin of victory versus amazing yeah, it was it was it was pretty big okay so you get through those two elections 70 72 you're in your uh, second term 73 74 you're in the Watergate. house through 78 <laughs> yeah and then Watergate comes in 74 but I mean what was your experience in the House while you were there? Uh, well, I was in the minority. Yeah. Uh, I hated that. I mean, I, I, I didn't have any real appreciation until I got there about uh, how what it meant Bill Ryan was the Speaker minority. of the House. Yeah. Bobby Crim was the floor leader for four years, and then the second four years, Bobby Crim's the Speaker. And um, you've got some pretty strong personalities there. Uh, uh, Gary Owen would be one. I mean, Bill well, Bill Copeland, then Dominic Jacob, any chair right, on the Appropriations right, right. Committee. You had, I, I'll tell you though, the one thing that helped me a lot, and the House was incredibly educational if you were interested in learning, because I, I sat on the floor, and here's Marty Booth, who knows about everything about local government you, you could want to know. Here's Stanley Powell, who, uh, I mean, a remarkable man because he's elected to one term in the House in the 30s, loses uh, because of the Depression, <laughs> and then goes to the Con Con and comes back after being a constitutional delegate in the 60s and then has a, a lengthy career. Right, right. Um, you had uh, Roy uh, Smith, who was an expert on uh, really on property, on taxes. Roy Spencer, who was an expert on school finance. Uh, you had uh, Jim Farnsworth, who was a great appropriations guy. Uh, we we had people, uh, Bill Hayward, who really knew a lot about insurance. He'd been on that committee for a lot of years. And so there was great, great knowledge and and experience that was there, and you could draw from that. And that's what term limits wiped out. It, it, it just it, it deprived all these incoming members of any kind of institutional knowledge. And so... You had people sitting there who could say, well, you know, we've tried this in the past. This is why it didn't work. Uh, this is what we wanted to do. And, uh, you know, and, and so for me, it was like uh, graduate courses in, in government and in, in policy. And it sure. was very, very helpful. Also, there were people who were, uh, I mean, who just knew the rules of, of the House. There was, in those days, you had a lot of debate on the floor. That's also something that seems they tell me to have kind of receded <laughs> almost to the point of, you know, it non-existent yes, exactly. anymore. And boy, that was not the case then. And um, and I learned in those days uh, a lot about how Bill, you know, I spent time with something called the Legislative Service Bureau. I went up and, uh, I mean, I had guys like Arnie Rich, who was there, and a, you know, prolific bill drafter. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I learned what the bill drafting manual was, how you wrote amendments, how how bills came together. And so I ended up with a tremendous amount of just institutional knowledge because one thing you can do in the minority, you can't you can't influence a lot, but you can learn a lot. And, right. and so, uh, of course, the more you know, then the more frustrated you are because, you know, you're, you're, you're frustrated about not being able to do much about right. it. Um, but we, we did have a lot of fun. I had some... Uh, good colleagues and some troublemakers. Bob Edwards and I were seatmates for a while. <laughs> Bob in 1976 actually runs for state party chair Remember that, um, yeah. and nearly beats uh, the, the, the Governor Sitting Milliken's ch chair. chair. Yeah. <laughs> it came, came very close. And that was when I first got to know Peter Secchia because he, oh, okay. he, he came into that. We, we got him in that race. I got him in trouble with Joyce Braithwaite, some of the powers that be in the Milliken administration because <laughs> he... He was uh, 
he, he wasn't loyal enough to to their <clears throat> liking but it was you know it was a it was a great time uh for us to to you know try things to learn things sure and and uh, and there's no question it helped me later on because it gave me a, a, a lot to draw upon. But by by 78, I, I have to get out of there. I mean, I just can't. <laughs> uh, you know, it was, and Governor Milliken won his first election in 70, as, as, right. as did I. Right. Uh, then in 74, and, and both of those elections for Governor Milliken were against Sandy Levin. So uh, 74 was a tough year, but, but by that time, Governor Milken, it, it kind of a, I think he was pretty well established in, in kind of the rerun against Levin. Those are, those right. are tough to do yeah. um, if you're, I think if you're the challenger especially. Right. Uh, by 78, it's Bill Fitzgerald, and, and it was, a, I would say, kind of a walkover there. Yeah, it was, yeah. But um, it was also in the 70s when Bob Griffin was, he was on the ballot uh, too. Right. Um, so I... You know, I got to know a lot of people during that that whole period. Um, Did you find yourself in the House, even though you're very frustrated in the minority, uh, getting more aggressive and assertive uh, against the majority, against Bill Ryan, Bobby Crim? <laughs> uh, they weren't too happy with you. They were weren't they? very happy. Uh, they, well, we, we, we felt that the minority was not our natural state. <laughs> we we believed at least a fair number of us that we should be in the majority. Um, my first four years, Cliff Smart was the leader and Dennis Cawthorn was the floor leader. Then Dennis became the leader in uh, the Republican leader those last two terms. Dennis a little more, uh, well, a lot younger, real smart, obviously. Yeah. You know, uh, and, and and so he was a little more freewheeling about you know kind of opening things up. Uh, and by that time, I'd been there long enough to start, to, you know, this is where one of the first people I got to know in the House Representatives on the staff uh, was Lucille Taylor, because I was on the insurance committee and Lucille was happened to be staffing that committee. She was a okay. young lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, I knew Bill Gnadke, I, and, but, but that's where uh, we got people like... Um, oh, there was, you know, we, we, we said the staff needed to be upgraded, and so we some of us got a chance to help then start to recruit people to be on the staff and raise the quality of the staff. And, uh, and that at the same time then helped us get uh, probably some of these ideas into the point where we could now maybe offer an amendment. And, <laughs> and, uh, and some of those amendments weren't appreciated by Bobby Krim very much. There was a, there was a point at which he had said, uh, this was probably the mid seventies or something where he said he'd, He'd, he'd trade five seats to get rid of me because I was apparently <laughs> becoming a bit of a problem for yeah. him. And I, I, of course, promptly offered to go if I could pick the five that went with <laughs> me, you know. <laughs> that was, uh, you know, I mean, but you could have, I mean, we had some pretty vigorous debates in yeah. those days. And I, and I do think, I, I tell legislators today that, I mean, it, you know, it's a serious process. It's a privilege to serve. But at the same time, understand that there, this, this debate's important, this conversation, uh, and you shouldn't shy away from it, and you, you certainly, certainly shouldn't uh, feel as though you can't speak up. And uh, we, we were, but, I, but I, by 78, I just said, look, I've, I've either got to, uh, you know, I was going to be, I was getting old, I was going to be 30, you know. I had to, <laughs> I had to, either I get up, I move up or move out. Um, and uh, so you decide to run against another incumbent. I another mean, you've already beaten the third two. race against an incumbent. Jack Tepp, who was a state senator from like Cadillac. Right. He much was, bigger district, Senate district. And I was in the in the district the way it was drawn. I was in Isabel County. I was in the very southern bottom of that district. The whole district went all the way up through uh, the Leelanau Peninsula, northwest Michigan. I was Traverse City was in the district. So it was Governor Milliken's senator. Uh, by that time, I, we had, we'd been involved in some criticism, let's say, of the party operation because the the one of the irritants was there was a absolute belief in the, and I don't know if this was the governor, Governor Milliken's belief, but clearly some of the people around him had the view that uh, 
Michigan, uh, if you go back, one of the books I read in college was Walt DeVries, The Ticket Spreader. Right. Ticket Splitter. Yes. Well, they, they had this belief that Michigan was such a ticket splitting state that you were never going to be able to win both offices. And, and, and both offices being, let's say, the governor's race and the U.S. Senate race. You couldn't win both of those, you know. So, and and that uh, that was almost like an admission against interest in the sense that you're, right. okay, we're, somebody's going to lose. It's not going to be me. It's going to be the other guy. Kind of I always right. felt that was what happened to Bob Griffin in uh, when he announced he was no longer going to run for office right. for the United States Senate. He was stepping down. And uh, Phil Rupi stepped up. Uh, he was going to run. And we had, you know, we knew Phil because he had a marvelous woman that he was married to, Lorette Rupi, sure. uh, who became a dear friend. Uh, but, but so Phil and Lorette were out there. Bob Davis, who was a state senator, was going to run for the congressional seat. Right. And um, change was happening. But this is 1978, and, and Bill Milliken's up for the third election. Right. And, and if elected, he'll then, he'll, he'll become the longest serving governor in Michigan history. He'll serve right. 14 years if he serves that whole term. They go and they talk Bob Griffin back into running again. And, and Griffin was already out. And when he announced it, he, his attendance had slipped. He wasn't, I mean, he'd been a, a, a force in the Senate, but all of a sudden he's leaving. And so he wasn't there. He certainly hadn't been let's just say, tending to the duties. And right. here comes the city council president out of Detroit, Carl Levin. And uh, well, not only that, in the primary, Brooks Patterson that's right. uh, ran against Bob Griffin and beat him over the head over exactly what you just described. It, it, well, that's exactly right. That, that's a, <laughs> Yes, that's a very, because that's, let's just say, softened him up. But, but and Rupi then Levin being, basically said in the general election, hey, don't listen to me. Listen to what Brooks Patterson is saying. Well, exactly. Yeah. And I don't think Bob's, Bob and Marge, their heart wasn't really in it at that point. I mean, I think he was a reluctant candidate. The Honorable Phil Rupi stepped back and said, okay, you know, I'll... He, and, but then he, then he also didn't go back to the Congress because he'd, he kind of... You know, he said he wasn't going to run, and Davis was already out there, so... He said, I, I won't do what Bob Griffin just did to me. I won't do that to Bob Davis. That, that's right. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, so it's... We, we have this amazing past. I mean, if you go all the way back, this is actually slightly before my time, but, Bill, you would remember this. I mean, look what happened to Regal when he wanted to run for the Senate. And sure. That was George Romney and Lenore, but, right. but you right. know, a, a similar kind of thing, although Regal's reaction a little less generous than Rupert. <laughs> <laughs> he ends up leaving the party and all kinds of, you know, but anyway. Uh, so how did you win this race against Jack Tip? So Jack Tip um, was, again, the the Senate in those days, uh, and I'll you know, tread you know, lightly here, but I mean there were there were a lot of members who had, you know, I think were had had some personal issues. I mean, I think there was a there was a lot of alcohol around the Senate in those days. I mean, and I think people had some issues, but Jack more I think more of the point. Jack Tip, a very nice man, and we we had a cordial relationship. And he and he was he he. Wanted to see me, and he wanted to talk to me. He said, well, please, please, you know, if you wait four years, I'll leave. I'll, you know. But, I mean, that was going to be redistricting again anyway, yeah. so that's kind of like a, well, not really. Yeah. You know, I kind of know how this works. I've seen this play before. Uh, and I said, look, I, you know, I'm sorry. It's just, it, it's either time, either, you know, you may well win, you know. Although we didn't think he'd win because we, we looked at the district and said, you know, we can win this. And, and he had been there. He was a senior guy. He was a. I think he might have been the floor leader, or he was he was he he was clearly a senior member. He was yeah. and he was part of the the ruling group in the Senate, if you will. But and they didn't the Senate didn't think. I remember you know some friends who were on the Senate staff. Well, there's no way you can you can't win this race, and we're looking at it. <laughs> there's no reason we won't. And we mm -hmm. won by I think two three thousand votes. It was pretty. It was actually a pretty comfortable race. But I did have. Uh, one of my good allies in that race is none other than State Representative Connie Binsfeld, uh, mm -hmm. who had the northern part of that district. Right. I used to stay at Connie's house when I, because it, it, the thing about that campaign, I always said it was helpful for me later on, especially in, in 1990, I guess, running statewide. 
you really learn the importance of scheduling and, and planning because your, your district was three and a half, four hours from sort of top sure. to bottom. Yeah. You couldn't run up four hours, do an hour to meet, and then come back because you know, now there's eight hours of travel, one hour meeting, so you right. had to figure out yeah. how to, do, how to uh, use your time properly. And, and uh, it, was a, it, was a great, it was a great district and wonderful people took me all the way over to Nuego County was in that district or not all of it, but part of it. There was even Custer Township and Antrim County oh uh, was in there. So wow. it was a sprawling district, Yeah, uh, but uh, we, we just had a good plan. We, we, well, did you feel you outworked Jack Tepp as well? I oh mean, yeah, we, yeah. no, I think we outworked him. I think we had, um, I mean, we, we had a tremendous grassroots support base mm -hmm. and, and Jack, frankly, it, Probably is the point where he, you know, I mean, if all things being equal, he might have chosen to retire. He should, probably should have retired yeah. because I think he'd, he'd been there long enough that you just get, and this happens, you get comfortable in these districts and yeah. you don't, you aren't going to the meetings, you aren't showing up the way you used to show up, or you get into a routine and you go two or three places and that's kind of all you do or you were there the any people. real issues in that campaign other than just hard work um, uh, strategic not, planning not really i mean i i like jack tepp and it, i mean he was mm -hmm. a friend i wasn't it wasn't something where i was uh uh you know i mean it was more about building a majority they didn't have a majority right. in the senate either and no. i thought there was an opportunity to build a majority in fact i thought in that election we had a chance to elect one because we thought millican in the 78 were going to run pretty strong he did. Uh, Unfortunately, Griffin did not run too strong. No, he did not. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it was, it was frustrating because we yeah. get there and we're a couple of seats short. And frankly, a couple of ones that we, we you know, we didn't win, uh, we thought we should have. Right. Uh, but, but nonetheless, I get to the Senate and uh, Harry Gast came over at the same time because Zoller had, had stepped down. Um, I think Jack Mowat came there at the same time from uh, Jack from Lenaway County. So there, I think Bob Young got there at roughly that from time. From Saginaw, yeah. yeah. So we had, a, we had a group of us that had been in the House that came over. We weren't the majority of the caucus, but we're, a lot of new blood all of a sudden right, showed right, up, and right. I think a lot of energy. Um, Bob Vanderlaan was the leader, uh, the, the Republic leader, but not, unfortunately, the majority leader. So we, we had... Um, and and you act at that time, Bill Faust was, uh, you know, right. Bill Faust had succeeded. In fact, I think if I got this right, I'm, I'd have to remember. I'm not sure I remember this detail because I think Fitzgerald maybe stepped down while he was running for governor, and Faust became the leader actually before the election of '78. Yeah, he actually was ousted by his own caucus oh, as leader. Right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, you were. Well, yeah. that was you were there for no. The, I was I was gone, gone by that bit. time. No, okay, you'd already gone. Okay, yeah. that's right though. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, because but in any event, so you're here with these new members, and it's like well, I'm, I'm thinking you know, 80. gee, we ought to get some of us, the newbies ought to step up here. But I mean, the, the incumbent leadership, uh, you know, had the, I would say, the guile and the smarts to be able to divide us rather quickly, right. and uh, those who made the first deals <laughs> first ones in got the best deals yeah. guys like me who didn't come in till yeah. the end uh, there wasn't much left for us and uh so i i spent uh you didn't that, even have very good committee assignments no no right what, but what you I eventually was, got them <laughs> what i was offered were so bad in, in terms of committees that while i was happy to be in the senate these committees were terrible and uh, <laughs> I, I told uh, senator van Lohan, i said look uh, and I'd come with a tiny bit of reputation for the house, I guess, of being willing to mix it up on the floor periodically. Uh, one of those examples from the house, which um, was, was very frustrating for Mr. Krim when he was speaker, on opening day when it's very ceremonial, the families are all there, the flowers are on the desks, everybody's getting sworn in, they're picking their seats, uh, but you adopt always your temporary rules. But that's a motion, you know, to adopt the rules. Right. 
Well, that was the first time somebody had a set of alternative rules Ooh. to be pending. Ooh. And so I had an amendment ready to go. We offered the amendment in the ceremonial session to the rules. And oh, my like, God. What, what, are these? <laughs> what are these? And, and, I, and, and they were things like, we had had a hard time getting recognized for record roll call votes. So we were trying to kind of clean that process up. Or um, there's something called immediate effect, a law that's passed by the legislature with a two thirds vote sure. can be made to be effective immediately upon signature by the governor without that two thirds vote of the House and Senate, then it has to wait until the session is over and 90 days after that. Right. So we were, and, and we had felt that our rights were impaired by not having a record roll call maybe on the granting of immediate effect. They would just gavel it through. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the time you could get recognized, uh, they would uh, regretfully announce that the bill had left the chamber. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't there. Now, this, this for our listeners, who what, what in the world is all this stuff? It's all the procedure of the legislature. Right. The legislature, if nothing, is a, a body, as is Congress, where procedure matters. Right. But it also matters who's got the gavel and who's sure. interpreting the rules. And so we were... Uh, on this opening day back in the House in the day, we're trying to just clarify how the minority right. could possibly have its rights sure. respected a little right. bit more. Right. Well, <laughs> this led to a roll call on opening day, and uh, yeah. they were they were not happy about that. So I'm in the <laughs> Senate, and so there is some of this, I guess, reputation that's there. So I said to Senator Van Allen, look, rather than give me these committees, which are so awful, why don't you give them to somebody else? And I'll just work on bills when they come to the floor. And if there's something that's of interest, then I can offer a amendment. That, that'll give me a little more flexibility. And then you can give these committees to somebody who's worthy of well, them. Well, what was his reaction to that? Well, I didn't want to, I wouldn't want to do that, he thought. And I said, no, that's okay. I don't mind at all. And so we ended up negotiating. And I got, at least I got a an appointment to the Judiciary Committee, which at the time yeah. was was a, a primary committee chaired by Basil yeah. Brown, so I yeah. got a chance to know Senator Brown, work with him, and uh, but it was a it was a committee that did substantive work, and as it turned well, out, so did you also start being assertive on the floor, just like you were in the House? No, I was uh, I was a bit more circumspect, but the other thing I decided to do uh, now I've got a four year term for the first time, and I mentioned Carol. Uh, Vivente, Carol Mori, uh, Carol had decided to go to law school. One of the other persons that was close to, uh, you, we, we talked earlier about this election against Dick Allen. One of the people that got recruited for that election to help was a guy named Dennis Coons. Dennis was from Kent County. Right. Dick Postumus knew him. Dick came back to run the campaign in 72. Dennis was actually driving the children's train in John Ball Park Zoo <laughs> in Kent County. <laughs> Dick knows him because of, uh, you know, I think Pam, maybe, or Dick's wife, Pam. Somehow, Dennis kind of a friend. We recruit Dennis to leave the John Ball Park Zoo <laughs> train and, and come. And he's never worked on a campaign, but we explain what we want done. He's good attention to detail. Now, Dennis, you talk about how things change. As we know, Dick Possumus later on becomes lieutenant governor, leader of the Senate, and then lieutenant governor. Dennis it, it becomes the chief of staff eventually in the Senate, uh, and he gets the law degree and eventually uh, becomes the president of the Michigan Bankers Association. We had a very distinguished career. Right. So it was, it was fun to see these uh, young people who had, had no exposure to politics suddenly you know, become involved in government and later on rise up to do but wonderful Car Carol things. Vivente. So Carol and Dennis were going to go to law school. And so that kind of inspired you like... Well, it did. I mean, I was... And, and, and the other issue is that I think for legislators, once you're there, in my case, I'd already been there eight years. I mean, I've, I have legislative experience now. Yeah. But what does that translate to? What's that mean? Especially if I leave the legislature. And so I thought it might be smart to get a law degree. Now, could I do that? Cooley had opened up uh, in the 70s, I guess, right. the law school, yes. literally across the street from the capital started by the former Chief Justice, Tom right. Brennan. And so I go to see Chief Justice Brennan, who's still president of Cooley Law School, and I said, well, 
I want to go to law school. He said, we have to take the LSAT. And I said, well, what's that? You know, <laughs> oh, okay, you better, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand. You know, look, we, we want to be accredited by the Bar Association. Students can't come here. You, here's the process. Right. So, so I couldn't start in January, but so I took the LSAT, did well, and was able to get into the law school then in Was April. that a tough thing to do, serving in the Senate and go to law school? All well, the time, sure. The time? I mean, lots of people have... Uh, and, and Cooley was actually designed, it was a night school, um, so it was designed for students who had busy lives. I mean, there were a lot of people there who were, I mean, you had doctors that were there. You had all kinds of people. Sure. It, was a, it was an interesting, uh, I mean, Brennan's concept, I think, was right. I mean, he, he attracted, especially in those early days, some pretty able students because, uh, you know, you... It wasn't the idea you went away for three years, went to law school, and came back. You 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 carried down with your life, went right. to law school. You yeah. you just had a lot. You were just became a lot busier. Right. In my case, um, I had to. Uh, I wanted to graduate with Carol and Dennis, and we and so I was. I had to catch up a term, and so I was able to graduate a term early. Uh, and the key to that was one one summer when in, in in this case it would have been 1980 uh the senate's not up for election the house is legislature kind of pauses a little bit there and so that summer i almost took a double load because we didn't have the session right, right. interfering and um so it, it you know i got through and uh pat and i had to take the bar then i knew i had to take the bar in february of 82 and uh carol and denny and i all took the bar at that time well past the bar and and that was you know done right. and then 82 is redistricting again and uh, that opened up the door for all kinds of uh, of uh, new members coming in new districts uh, my district for the first time I lost all of northwest Michigan Connie then became a senator she she had a district literally that worked out perfect for her and I went Midland became part of my district so that okay. was my exposure and introduction to that area and um, at the same time, Dick Postumus, there's a seat in Grand Rapids. He runs for that and is successful. A guy named Norm Schinkel is winning down in Monroe. Dan DeGroe over in St. Clair County and Port Huron. Doug Cruz in Oakland County. And all of a right, sudden, all right. these people are coming in who either were in the house or were, in the case of like Dick and Norm, just, you know, good friends. And right. so we show up after the 82 election and there's... 18 members again we fall short of winning the majority yeah you picked up a lot of seats but you didn't quite make yeah, it we, we you're in the minority 18 again. but 11 of the 18 are brand new to the senate right and almost all of them are friends so i am able to be the i'm elected senate leader republican leader and um jim blanchard at the same time has defeated dick headley uh for governor that, yeah for governor uh that summer in uh in Again, uh, Bill Milliken had run with Jim Brickley in 1970, and that right. was made sense because Brickley was a, also a Detroit councilman. He's running right. against Levin, so yeah. he, he wanted that yeah. balance. Yeah. Brickley, by that time, is four years, wants to leave. He picks Jim Damon, uh, a, 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 State a good, rep. good man, State, State rep, rep. A good friend, uh, yeah. and, and Jim and Peg were, were dear friends, and they... But for a variety of reasons, that, that is not a marriage that works. Uh, and so in 78, Milliken brings Brickley, Brickley back. Brickley had been, he'd yeah. had a stint by that time as president of Eastern Michigan, I believe. Correct, correct. And I think he was looking to get out of that, and yeah. it, it sort of all worked. Yeah. Uh, but then the idea, clearly, for Brickley was he comes back, lieutenant governor, then can run for governor in 82. Right, right. Um, so he's like opposed Jim. by Dick Headley and Brooks Patterson. That's right. I'll never forget that primary. <laughs> it was an amazing primary. Un unbelievable. And uh, big shock. Uh, I'm one of like two people in the Senate supporting Headley, but I've known Dick. Dick Headley was a constituent of mine. He was up in Wynn, Michigan. He came to Michigan to help George Romney become president. That didn't happen, but Headley and the Headley family stayed right, there. Right, right. Uh, Rosebush, uh, wasn't it? Um, uh, we lived in Rosebush and ran, he was down at Moorbark Industries <laughs> in Wynn, Michigan, working for <clears throat> one of the most unforgettable characters you'll ever meet, a guy named Norval Morey, Nub Morey. And uh, 
Nub was a guy that had sixth grade education, I think, before he dropped out of school and, uh, and was <laughs> logging and builds this fabulous company and brings Headley in. And he, he once joked about Headley that he had to get him out of there because he was too damn smart. He'd end up holding the whole damn company. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but but anyway, that's how I get there with Headley. And then, he, of course, he was, you know, by this time, he's, he's long left Moorbuck Industries and he's running a company called Alexander Hamilton Life right, Insurance Company. Right, that's right. where he was when he was running for governor down in, in Oakland County. So I help Headley. Uh, another senator named Harry DeMasso is, is on board, but that's it. But Headley is, uh, he prevails. He, he's a mm-hmm. very... Mm-hmm. Uh, one would say acerbic, perhaps. Would that be a... <laughs> acerbic? Yes. Yeah. He... Very, very funny guy. Yeah, he was that. funny. Yeah, but, but he uh, kind of a that tongue guy himself. He got himself in some trouble at yeah. various times yeah. with yeah. things that he said. And but anyway, he loses to Blanchard, and mm-hmm. then uh, you're with this new gang of new members in yeah. 1983. You're in the minority again, but by a narrow margin. Blanchard is governor. And he Gary pro- Owen is speaker. And Gary Owen is speaker over in the House, and the governor proposes an income tax increase. So yep. what happened after well, that? Well, uh, and he has uh, s- some smart guys working for him, like Bob Bowman, um, who's his treasurer and kind of point man and all this right. stuff. And, uh, and there's all kinds of conversation, negotiation going on, and there probably was a way, because there was, there was no question there was a, fiscal deficit to be addressed. Right. Uh, but they were going to do it all through new revenues and taxes, and that wasn't going to sell in the Republican caucus in the Senate. Uh, and so back and forth the conversation goes, and eventually they put the, get the votes to put the income tax above 6% without us. I mean, they don't... They, 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 they peel off a couple of Republicans, and, and, they, and they get it done. And uh, that uh, creates, there's been enough of a debate, enough of a discussion publicly that people are not exactly caught by surprise, they're unhappy, and it prompts a recall of of two members of the Senate and sort of unprecedented, there hadn't been recalls. I don't know if there'd ever been recalls, but, but certainly not of sitting legislators over a tax vote, but... Uh, I don't think ever. And those yeah, two ever. senators were David Sorotkin. And Phil Maston. And Phil Maston. And, uh, Kirby so, Holmes and Ruby Nichols when those two the senators are recalled. And then, so suddenly the 2020 Senate's 1818 with two vacancies that are going right. to be filled in special elections in January. I think it was January 31 of... Uh, of uh, 84. 84. Yeah. And we win both those special elections and we've got a new majority leader. And that's me as it turns out, and new committee chairs. One of the things that was done then that I am proud of that I think made, a, made an impact probably for a long time was that we really did, uh, when I was minority leader, we, we kind of uh, made the decision that the seniority system wasn't serving us well. And, and it, it was never a written rule. It was sort of uh, honored, if you will, by expectation. But we really kind of set that aside and put best people in spots. So here's Dick uh, Postumus as the the ranking Republican on the Commerce Committee. Okay. Uh, or or um, you know different people. Harry Gast was a probes because he'd had experience there. But a guy like Dan DeGroo was suddenly he was playing a major role, even though he just arrived in the Senate or a Norm Schinkel over on the finance committee. Right, right. And as a result, when the majority flipped, all of a sudden, here comes uh, Dick Postumus, now chair of the Commerce Committee, and he's basically after 13 months in the Senate. Right. Or Schinkel chairing finance. Right. But then uh, we also paid attention to who the other members of the committee were, so that you had very strong Commerce Committee, very strong Finance Committee. And um, and I think the 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 effect of that was to give us uh, individuals in positions with key committees that were able to articulate what we were trying to do as an agenda. Right. This this was what we 
believed in this, what we stood for. And, and it really, um, over, a, over a period of years, I think, served us quite well with those people. And I think had we, had we stuck with what might have been the old system and said, well, this person's been here five years longer than this person, then they should, you know, they get it. Right. And, and we had enough, um, I guess, support in the Senate to kind of tip that old system Change over. That. yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and I, I would guess that you'd have to say term limits, you know, to whatever extent there was something of the seniority system left, term limits finished it off, yeah, you know. Yeah, that's but, for but, sure. But we'd made that start in the 80s. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm convinced that that was one of the reasons that we were able to survive in 1986, because if we fast forward to the next election here, uh, were Bill Lucas is the, becomes the Republican nominee. Bill had been a, a a Democrat official, a sheriff in Wayne County, then county the first county executive, and and so suddenly then he switched parties. He switched parties, and and his his uh, consigliere was none other than Dennis Nystrom, who had been uh, one of Dick Headley's top people, <laughs> and so Nystrom had a lot of experience. Uh, but you know that that switch, and that was thought that Lucas, this you know, Fordham grad, you know, yeah. a lawyer, former well FBI as, agent. I yeah, think. no, yeah. he had a sterling yeah. kind of background. Yeah, but he also had not really been in partisan politics, and the switch made him, I guess, suspect with some people, and yeah, whatever. He 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 turned out. Uh, Let's just say the campaign didn't go well. Uh, <laughs> Blanchard, of course, had um, a, a unified party behind him and probably a pretty hungry party after the recalls had cost him the Senate, which is interesting because to this day, from 1984 to present, the Republicans have controlled the Senate ever since. Yeah, exactly. And, and so they've never yielded that. Well, also, and the economy had recovered completely by much. 1986, and the income tax hike was three years before. And so Blanchard ends up winning this huge landslide victory. Well, that had to be a huge threat to the Republican narrow 2018 majority. Right. How are you going to hold on to control the Senate with the coattails from a Democratic governor though, that deep To this day, I mean, those of us who were involved in that considered our finest hour, if you will, in terms of just election yeah. Yeah. success, because it, 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 was, it was, I would say, universally thought to be impossible to yeah. hold the Senate. Yeah. But we had, we had good candidates, and I think we had great campaigns. We also had the... Uh, the benefit of really excellent talent in all the right spots because uh, at the time Spence Abraham was the party chair but his chief of staff and top guy was Dave Doyle over there Dave and Spence uh, in their prime were very 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 good yeah Tom Shields was running a company called MRG but Tom was on the rise he, he'd had some success and the people he had in his firm were very good uh, you know Dick was there in the caustic posthumous. He's very talented. We had, we had just a, a, you know, sort of a convergence of all of the, the kind of right people, and we literally were meeting almost every night to talk about what happened that day, what's going to happen the next day, what's going to happen the next week, and thinking these things through. And we had started early with fundraising to be able to have enough money to win these seats. We thought. There might be an opportunity. I think, um, let's see, Ruth Braun was running against Jerry Hart, I think, in 86. I remember. And I think that's right. And Ruth was a very able candidate, a wonderful person. Right. And, and Jerry had had some health setbacks. So right, right. there was a thought that there might be a chance in yeah. that seat. And there was another one where, um, I'm trying to think what the other, there were a couple others that we thought, you know, could we could we play for any gains out there? Was there anybody that could to offset what the Democrats might? Yeah, pick is there up? going to be a loss that we don't see? Yeah, yeah. And so, where could there be a gain? As it as it turned out, and as we went along, we literally had to almost pull right back and just say, look, any 
pennies and dimes that we've got have to go <laughs> on the 20 incumbents, and we're going to have to we're going to have to go with that. And that that at the end of the day, Ruth probably is not going to be able to make this happen. Yeah. And I remember I Alan. One other, I've, for, I've forgotten which other seat. There were a couple of them that we were playing in, but we pulled back and and you know with the Grand Rapids seat with Vernon Ellers, I think it was a challenging one. Yeah. Uh, although Vern, again, very good candidate, and later goes on to right validate that with lots of terms sure. in Congress. So yeah. so we it, it just all worked together with the kind of candidates we had, the kind of campaigns that were right. run. And I think Democrats probably had, uh, I think in some cases they w probably would have loved to have had different candidates in yeah. a couple of these districts. Yeah. But but we, we survived and it was it was absolutely remarkable. I think people were stunned. Yeah. But th that set the stage, um, you know, coming back again uh, for, uh, you know, what what we were able to do prospectively. Right, in, in the next four years. Well. You know, sometimes not running for something is a wise decision, just as much as knowing when to run for something. Like in 86, you could have run then. I, I could have, uh, perhaps. I mean, it wasn't, I didn't think I was necessarily ready. Uh, but after it, four years in 90, you, you decided, I've been leader for seven years, yeah. I am ready. Uh, enough of this. I want to challenge the Democratic governor, Jim Blanchard, running for Yeah, and we term. didn't know for sure that he was going to run. I mean, until, but yeah. then then it, it became clear that he would. Yeah. Had he not, uh, it would have been interesting because I don't, again, there wasn't a logical, you know, person. I think, you know, Jim Blanchard had picked Martha Griffiths to run with him initially. Right. She was a great asset to him, I think. We'd gotten to know Martha quite well because she's the Senate president. Right, right. Uh, and then he disinvited her to run yes, in, yeah. in that third race. Uh, that that was, clearly hurt him. That hurt him. Yeah. And that set up, uh, I mean, we, we were, I think I was inclined anyway. We were, we, we were able to keep it completely quiet as to where I was going with a running mate choice. But... Uh, Connie became uh, more and more logical as to be the right choice because I was trying to think, uh, you know, how does this, how does it work? And, yeah. and, and again, it's a bit counterintuitive because, okay, I'm from Mount Pleasant or Central Michigan. Now I'm picking somebody from Northwest Michigan. Yeah. But Connie had spent much of her life in Oakland County. She'd mm -hmm. done mother of the year she'd been the, mm -hmm. the, the you know the girl scout mm -hmm. leader she'd raised her family there before she moved up and became a, right. a county commissioner a state rep and a state senator and uh we knew that we had a good relationship with right. you know connie and i and when he when governor blanchard decided to make the change from martha griffiths we thought this this really kind of seals the deal because if we pick connie He's almost he, going to have to pick, pick another, another woman. woman. Yeah. And you looked at the female, the Democrat candidates at the time. You said, "Well, who who in the world could it be?" And yeah. You know, and he ended up with Libby Maynard. I, you know, I, you know, it was nice very, person, very nice but person, but didn't she, do anything for these tickets. No, at all. Yeah. And, and and either from a campaign standpoint or a a a, I guess a strategic standpoint, she brought nothing with right. her. There's no right. constituency came with right. her that he didn't already have completely right. locked up. Right. Whereas Connie uh, was helpful for me because um, I, you know, I think that, you know, I was single, so there people were, you know, I think Connie was somebody that just, and she complimented me nicely, and I think our ability to work together was, right. was, was quite good. And so I, I, I felt, I always felt very good about Connie and loved Connie and John. They were just, they were, they were good friends, and that really worked out quite well. Well, now, 1990, I mean, you really are an underdog in this race, at least as much, if not more, than you were against Russ Strange in 1968. Yeah, and now, you, now the incumbents of the other party. You know, yeah. It's one thing to beat incumbents yeah. in primaries. It's quite so, another to beat so in how did election. you pull it off in your estimation? Uh, when all is uh, said and done, there's so many theories about how you pulled off well, this miracle. I had, certainly we prepared hard. I mean, I you know, I think one of the advantages I had there, there was no learning curve in terms of state issues or uh, the agenda. I mean, I had 20 years in the legislature, so I'm, I'm 
coming into a campaign as as fully prepared about to discuss any issue that right. people wish to raise. Sure. And I had, uh, in leading up to this, had been going out doing these county visits and and it's something, you know, the fir- the entire first term I was able to do that. So literally, I, had, you know, but but for the before the election, two consecutive years I'd been in every county in the state, and and we were we had the advantage of not having a a, a serious primary. There was a there was a primary a gentleman named John Love was in the primary, but so so there was there was that. But really, I had a unified party. Right. Uh, mostly unified in the belief I couldn't win. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know, we can be for him. He can't win anyway. Uh, but but that that really helped. We had a very small campaign. I mean, in in the sense of paid people. Dan Perot was the campaign manager. Dan had come back from Texas. He'd always said years earlier. He he, he joked about it. But I said, well, I'm holding you to this. That you, if you ever run for governor, I'll come back and run the campaign. And Dan and Colleen were in Texas, but brought them back that's how i met michelle is through dan and colleen right right but um dan and colleen came back and were instrumental in the campaign uh we had in 1988 uh what was very important experiences in helping george bush prevail in a convoluted caucus process but we had uh the uh leanne uh, Reddick was very much part of that, uh, Leanne Wilson, because she she was kind of the political director of the, of the Bush campaign, and she had worked for Lausma before, but she had, she had a lot of experience. So Leanne was there. She was Dan's deputy and the political director of our campaign. Okay. Uh, Jim Brandell came over and he joined us, and uh, Andrea Newman, Andrea Fisher, who is our finance chair although she wasn't she was a not a paid staffer um and john truscott you know i mean the youngest press secretary in the world (laughs) comes forward but again a a real talent uh and uh and that was kind of the team a couple others and but we were so we had we had experience on that small staff team and the ability to build the network the bush connections had given us uh, you know, because, and then ultimately it became when, when Kemp and Bush aligned, right. uh, it, you know, it, it gave us a big broad base out, out, out across the state. Right. And so we could draw upon that. I mean, I, I marveled in this last election, people struggled to get petitions signed. Our only issue was, could we, we wanted to have a petition for every County since we'd been in all the counties right, so we right, ought to get right. one. And we yeah. did. Yeah. I mean, we had, I, there were a couple of them that we were like, Where's that last petition from? I forget where it was. Up at some place, Montmorency, maybe. I don't know. It was one of these right. smaller counties. But you know, no, no issue at all. Didn't pay. You don't. We didn't pay for a single signature. And and we had also started a, a little club, a hundred dollar club, and, and that was for purposes of ultimately having matching monies. And yeah. we were going to take the the matching funds because we we didn't have a lot of money, so yeah. we would do that. So I, I think it was just, it was very well organized. Uh, not only did I work hard, but the, the, the yeah. team worked hard. Well, and let, let me switch gears a little bit and talk about issues. I mean, the sure. big issue I remember in 1990 was property tax relief right. and taxes and a tax cut. Remember, there were two ballot proposals. Uh, right. And I think the spring of 1989, they both were That's defeated down. because the public was very suspicious. What is this? And uh, look, this was a seminal issue in 1990. You made great use of it. Uh, you came up with what people have called ever since the nickel ad. Right. And so well, tell Governor us about Blanchard that. Well, came out with a proposal, much maybe to our surprise, was about, uh, I remember the big number was $68 million or something. And, and I don't know if it was John Cost or somebody on the staff. And this is another... Uh, probably asset that I had uh, when we were in the minority in the Senate and then those years when we had the majority in the Senate but we're a minority in state government we we always described ourselves as a government in exile 
<laughs> so we, we uh, you know, and we worked hard to have that mentality that, right, you know, right. almost in a parliamentary way that yeah, we're, the, exactly. we're the opposition party. We're right. the loyal it's opposition. It's only a matter of time. Before only a matter you can of time. In there. And, and so there was great care given to hiring some very talented and able people on our staff. And so you had Lucille Taylor as the, the counsel. Lucille ends up being my lawyer for like 19 years, all seven as the right. you know, majority of the Senate and then 12 as governor. Uh, a guy like Dennis Shornack, a, a man like John Cost, um, and, on, <clears throat> and on it went. I mean, people yeah. that in each of these areas were, were quite good. And, um, and, and so there was a constant flow of, of some pretty good ideas. And the Senate Fiscal Agency, well, that's a, 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 an agency that served everybody, and, and appropriately so, but it was headed by uh, Patty Woodworth and Doug Roberts. So two people later on who would become a, a budget director and a treasurer. Again, right. people with abilities and, uh, and skills that helped us, I think, uh, in, in terms of policy and understanding. And so when somebody says, as the governor did, $68 million, some smart person on staff, well, that's a nickel a week. <laughs> and, and so, and we had a very creative and very, and, and he was on the ascent at that point. He'd had a couple of campaigns and he'd been very creative. A guy named Mike Murphy comes in as the, as the ad man. Wow. Um, and so Mike, uh, working with Dan Perot, who had a excellent creative side as well, uh, we're, we're good at crafting these messages. And so that nickel a week, <laughs> then we also realized it was actually cheaper to hand out a nickel than, than to pay for a brochure, which was costing more than a nickel to make. And so we ended up getting these bags of nickels and everywhere we'd go, hey, look, governor's tax plan's a nickel a week. I'll give you a nickel, you know, but we can do a hell of a lot better than that. And so mm -hmm. that became a little bit, mm -hmm. and, and it kind of caught on and, you know, people, you know, people were making nickel pins. There were clocks with nickels well, in them. Well, there was a I mean, TV ad, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. The, the TV ad was great. Skating down. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so that, that was part of it. Again, that's part of sort of my theory. You, you, you got to make these things a little bit fun, too. Yeah. Because I, I do think humor is a lost art uh, of, uh, I mean, everybody's so grim and solemn and sullen, you know. You know right. It, it, you, I think you, because people are, I always used to say you never underestimate the common sense of, you know, th there's more common sense in the coffee shops out across the state than there is in the committee rooms in yeah, Lansing. Yeah, and yeah. there's a lot of truth to that. There is, and yeah. uh, so, so that campaign just had a lot of stuff coming together. We still, I mean, I had people, you know, even the ones that would write a check say, well, I don't think you win, but, you know, you're working hard and we're going to support you. Right. Blah, blah. Right. Well, Literally, I mean, I, I joked that we, we, we got to the finish line and sort of fell over. If it had been the day sh campaign lasted a day shorter or been a day longer, we probably wouldn't have won. But it was just sort of right. it happened to all kind of right. come together. And, you know, 17,000 vote margin. And um, On election eve, you, did you feel fairly confident at that point that you we, thought you could pull it off? We did. We, we, yeah. we clearly knew we had the momentum. Mm -hmm. uh, we were dealing with... Uh, one of the curses of modern campaigns, and that's the press who, uh, rather than working hard to cover a race, uh, they prefer often to make their, uh, to create the story by paying for a poll themselves yeah. and then writing a story about the poll they took, yeah. which, <laughs> I, I mean, it's not, not news at all. It's just yeah. they make up a story and, yeah. Yeah. and they, they are still at it. And the polling back then wasn't any better than some of it is today. And, yeah. and we knew that poll was way off because we had, uh, and it was kind of a race against time. We didn't, we get there. We, you could see it moving. You could see Question it was going to be very you close. Can we get it there by election? Can day? we get there by election? Day? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there were, uh, you know, I think we, we worked hard to try to create advantages and to, uh, you know, everything just kind of came together. And I, there's no question there was overconfidence on the other side too. I think they, you know, until it, I mean, some of the stuff I've read after the election, I mean, in some cases years later, is that they also picked up right at the end, there was momentum going against them. Yeah. But by that time it was a little bit late. There, yeah. there wasn't too much 
the ability yeah. to change what, that. What about the situation between, let's say, Jim Blanchard and Coleman Young, who was mayor of Detroit, was not that great. And uh, right. I think basically Blanchard didn't want Young mucking around in the campaign. He thought that would be uh, disadvantageous for him. And so he basically kind of said to Young, hey, we got this, uh, stay out of it. And Young said, okay. And people just didn't turn out in Detroit. There, there was no question there was some of that. And um, the personal relationship wasn't that good. Young had had this great relationship with, with Milliken. Milliken, yeah. And, and that was very tight. Uh, we had, as a Senate leader, I had the opportunity to work with the mayor. And so we had an open line of communication and we did talk. And the thing that was very important to Coleman Young, I mean, I mean, and, and we did have this connection since he'd served in the state Senate and we knew a lot of people in common still, uh, but he was also, there was a regard for that legislative background. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim Blanchard had been in Congress, but never been in the legislature. So right. I think there was a little, you know, a possible disconnect yeah. there. Yeah. And, and a little bit of, uh, I think on the mayor's part, a perception that th these guys in Washington don't actually know everything kind of a, <laughs> kind of a thing. I mean, I mean, some of that, I think. And, they, mm -hmm. and you also had a natural uh, suburban Detroit. I mean, the, the Oakland County Detroit relationship was never, was never right. Awesome, you know. So, no, so, not so good. that 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 gets picked up too a little bit. I didn't have any of that baggage because I'm Mount Pleasant. I don't have any, you know, we don't have any nexus there. And the other thing I think that was important, and and I think this was, I, I would like to think this is true with everyone, is that there was never any um, BS about, you know, we could do this or we can't do it. it wasn't, and if right. we said we would do it, we did it. Yeah, you know, it's not a. It was not a, and as Senate leader, I think we were able to, uh, you know, and the Senate was able to, if we promised somebody that we could make something happen, it would then happen. Mm -hmm. and, and so we didn't have any of these broken promises where, right. oh yeah, they talk a big game, but when it comes time to produce, they don't. They don't, yeah. And I think there was some of that with perhaps the executive office on, on some issues. I'm not sure I even know all of the... Yeah. Uh, the the interrelationships there, but I there's no question that uh, you know we had you know throughout the campaign plenty of access to the mayor and the ability to talk and um, that helped. and 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 to have an understanding of how we would relate were I to be the governor and right. he's the mayor so, right so it was, you know and you never know what that's worth but I think it's clearly when you look at a close election, you say everything like that helps to some extent. Yeah. So uh, let's look at the big elephant in the room here. We've been touching on it uh, with your campaign in 1990, and that is property tax relief, the whole funding mechanism for the Michigan school system, K through 12 uh, funding, it was an issue when you ran against Russ Strange in 68 and it, 70, it very, all through your legislative career. That is And you're totally immediately true. confronted with it. You become governor. It's still not solved. Uh, and, and so it leads all the way up to the famous Proposal A. But just give me your perspective, the broad sweep of your experience with that issue, because it really dominated things. Uh, way more than it does today. I mean, sure, school finance is a big issue today, but in those days, it was like it, huge. It was. I mean, you're exactly right. I mean, I I actually came across one of those old brochures from that very first campaign, and you're, you're exactly right. 1970, more than a half century ago now. Right. That was the first brochure was talking about high property taxes. Right. And that lasted through the entire time of my service in the legislature yeah. and into that first term as governor. Right. And in fact, the first two years as governor, we tried twice with the ballot proposals as right. did Governor Blanchard. Right. We failed. We came actually closer than the Blanchard proposals. Yeah. We also failed. We got the closest ever defeat. Yeah, I think know. the one in, <laughs> in June of 73, remember, you almost, I think you won in every county in the state. Excuse me, 93, except for Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb. You lost those and three lose. and you yeah. lost. Yeah. So, 
Then, uh, then what happens? Well, uh, needless to say, there was a lot of frustration and an awareness that if we don't get something done here, this is not going to end well. Because, I mean, it is what we had talked about sort of incessantly. Right. And, and we knew how vexing the problem was because it's been around for so long. Um, and yet we were frustrated. And the idea by 93 is, gosh, you know, next year's election year. And, and uh, you want to prove of, you can deliver. That's what you were telling Coleman Young. Yes. If we say something's going to happen, it's going to happen. All well, of a we, sudden you're saying, we got to make it happen. Well, we told a lot of people in Michigan it was going to happen, and it hadn't happened yet. Um, and so the, the measure was a, and I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm not sure I'm right on the number, but it was a 25 or 30% reduction or something in property taxes that yeah. somebody figured out and it was going to be attached to this bill the bill comes over from the house to the senate and in the senate the conversation you know most assuredly is this at least among the minority at the time which democrat minority you know we're not going to give him a win on this we don't you know don't, we're not going to we're not going to bail him out especially right. him you yeah. know <laughs> yeah. you know so uh and they and they come up with this idea to i think it's embarrass the Republicans, or to embarrass maybe the Republican governor. Put him on the spot. Yeah, well, and this was... This uh, was Debbie Stabenow, Stabenow, the state Stabenow was senator. very much part of this, because yeah. whether she was the first one or not, I mean, it's often suggested that she was, uh, but I remember Art Miller, when he came and, you know, sort of... He was the Democratic... He was, Art was the Democratic leader, pretty yeah. good friend, Yeah, the, the late Art Miller now. I mean, he yeah. just did a... But, but Art... We, we had, again, open line of communication with right, Art, and right, he came right. and said, look, you ought to know this is what we're, we're thinking about. Yeah. So we got a little heads up from oh, him. Oh, you did have that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't a, surpri it wasn't yeah. a surprise. Well, well basically, but, Stabenow recommended just wiping out all property Yeah, well, why don't we property yeah, basically, taxes. and I think the idea was let's put up a vote to eliminate all property taxes. That'll embarrass them. Yeah, because in other words, she's challenging the Republicans to put their money where their mouth yeah. is. If you guys really want, here's here's a big one. How can you vote against this? Exactly, right? exactly. And and I think everyone thought that was going to be really cute. That was going to be a very funny thing to watch that one happen. But when when Art Miller indicated that's what we might be confronting in the Senate, right. uh, it you know, we kind of said. Well, what, let's think about this for a minute. And, yeah. and so we we had a couple of conversation sessions, if you will, and you know Dick got involved. He was the leader in the Senate. Dan DeGroe, because he's very much involved in school finance issues. Um, Hilligans, because in those days, what people he was the House Republican leader. He, he was the co-speaker. Co-speaker. Yeah, because yes. uh, the first two years we had a Democrat House. Right. And then. Uh, in 1992, we end up with a tie, 55-55. Right. Right. So you had co-speakers. Co-speakers, Hertel and Paul Hilligans. Right. And, and the way that worked was a very novel solution uh, because they couldn't quite figure out how to, to split a 110-member house. I mean, it was divided equally. So they said, okay, uh, we'll make everything equal, but one month, the one party will chair the committees and the other party will chair the, have the speakership. The next month, we'll flip it. The other party will, somebody will have the speaker, and then the other guy gets get the committees. So we looked at it as load and reload. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so you had one month, you get your bills out of committee. The next yeah. month, you get them past the house, yeah. and, you know, you know if, if all went well. And it, and it actually worked pretty well. It, it and, worked and, pretty well. Though. Yeah, and, and I think Paul and, uh, it's interesting, Hertel's chief of staff in those days uh, was none other than the current president of Blue Cross Blue Shield, Dan, Dan Lepp. Lepp. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And anyway, the, this all it came past. Maybe Lepp was the one who wrote the book. I, he might have. I, I forget. Mm -hmm. There's a. I think there's a book in there, or out there. Anyway, um, it happens that all this is happening when Hilligans is the speaker, so he's got the control of the floor. We kind of have this conversation. The more we talk about it, I'm. I'm 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 ready to try about anything and and 
and we had always been frustrated in the school finance uh, reform debate by the uh, gap that couldn't be resolved or the split, I guess maybe is a better way to say it, uh, that existed among districts because you had rich districts and not rich districts. Right. Rich districts were those school districts that had tremendous property tax wealth. And some of them could be just from affluent areas, but there were others like uh, Bridgman down in southwest Michigan. They happened to have the Cook Nuclear Power Plant sitting in their school district, mm -hmm. small district, big power plant, mm -hmm. lots of money. Lots of so money, you could yeah. keep your individual taxes very low sure. and still have lots of right. cash flow. Right. Uh, and there was nothing you could ever do to satisfy the rich districts. Uh, and I used to joke, it was like, you know, the, the perfect was the mortal <laughs> enemy of the better because <laughs> every time you'd say, this is better than what we've got, they would say, no, wait a minute. You've got a perfect, we know there's a perfect plan. It's hiding, you've got in the bottom drawer, you know, it, you know, you haven't shown it to us yet. Or you can do better than that. There's clearly a better, mm -hmm. a more perfect answer somewhere mm -hmm. out there. And you just couldn't get past this. You, and there were enough votes that it always ended up stymieing you. Mm -hmm. Well, the one thing about a bill that eliminates all property taxes there's no rich districts anymore. They're all poor. <laughs> you know, nobody's got any money. And everybody now has to come to the table. So that was definitely a factor to think through. Yeah, I mean, Michigan was one of the highest property tax states in the nation, one That's of right. the lowest sales tax states That's in the correct. nation. Income, we we're kind of like right in the middle, income tax. Yeah. And yeah. so what this does, it flipped it, really. It, uh, it, it completely changed things. And, and I will, I will say, we did not know what the answer was going to be. But we said, this will change the debate. That we knew. That, that, uh, that was uh, for sure. And, and so the, the, basically, the, the, the setup was this. You know, I don't know if they'll really offer this amendment, you know. <laughs> But, but you I know were they ready. think they're going to be cute. You were yeah. ready, though. The Senate we were ready, was, yeah. and we knew it was coming. So it was basically set up that Dick uh, and Dan would, you know, would have questions. They'd, they'd, they'd be concerned about it, but have a guy like Jack Wellborn, who was happy to vote for it, <laughs> have Jack get up and say, by gosh, this is the best thing ever. <laughs> and, you know, and the Democrats say, well, Jack doesn't really speak for that caucus, you know. Uh, and... So, I mean, they literally talked themselves right into it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and even though there were, I'm sure, some saying, eh, I'm not sure it's a great idea, by the time the debate was done, you know, everybody's, yeah, they're all <laughs> riled up, ready to go. And they're thinking the Republicans are going to vote no because they're, you know, yeah. instead, all the, you know, they wait and all of a sudden all the green lights are out. <laughs> and the damn thing passes. And Al Short, who was the, lobbyist for the Michigan Education so she was probably ready to jump out of the gallery and onto the floor. Uh, I mean, because I think he th what he thought was a clever idea all of a sudden yeah. is in flames. Yeah. I mean, oh my God, this is a bill that's just passed the state Senate. Yeah. Now it's going back to the House, and the bill was a House bill. So the, what, and procedurally what happens, that comes back to the Senate, the first vote in the House is you want to concur in what the Senate did. Right, right. Well, here's all these House members, 110, they look over and their senator just voted to eliminate property taxes. Now, do you think they want to now say, wait a minute, no, I love <laughs> no. property taxes? <laughs> Hell no. They want, they want to vote for it too. Sure. And next thing you know, and, and this is all happening literally in 24 hours, so there's no time to rally the forces because this thing's over. Yeah. The vote takes place... I don't know, it was morning, late morning or early afternoon, whenever it takes place. But the next morning, because the Senate would meet, you know, in, in earlier in the day and the House is coming in the morning, boom, yeah, it's done. And, of course, the editorials and the people are just going crazy. <laughs> I mean, this, what are you doing? You can't listen. Sure we can. You just watch, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. And so we had a big bill signed down on Henry Ford uh, at the Greenfield Village, the old one-room schoolhouse. And... Uh, there we go. And I had said when I signed it that I'll, you know, come back to the legislature in the fall when they come back to session. Uh, 
because this was a year hence, so it wasn't right, it wasn't right, immediate. Right, right. But um, so they were on their last year of property taxes. Then there'd be something else. And I said, come to legislature, and I did in early October of of, of 1993, laid out a plan. But then uh, over the summer, what we worked on. So wait a minute, this is such an historic opportunity. Not only can we fix the way we fund schools, but now we can get at the fundamental issue of school reform. Right. And so uh, that then opens the door to have dramatically expanded choice among public schools, the traditional schools, as well as the establishment of new types of uh, public schools called charter public schools. Mm-hmm. And and with that, well, who can authorize those? Well, not you know, you know. I think I used the phrase in the speech: a monopoly of mediocrity was what we had. So you couldn't trust the monopoly to be uh, adventuresome and create new schools that would become competitors. So that that allowed. I mean, you could a school could charter, so could the intermediate school, or the, but also the universities could. And, and mm-hmm. the universities were important because the governor appoints the governing boards there. Mm-hmm. So you have the ability to have on those governing boards people who would share your philosophy sure. about let's have competition. And in higher education, competition is not at all a new concept. Right. That's what they do is they compete right. mightily for students and programs and right. reputation. So so it was pretty, and frankly, almost, you know, in, in, in even in uh, governmental services or, or public services, there's a lot of competitions out there in almost every area except the K-12 system, which had created right. exclusive franchises based on geography, and at the same time provided a, an exit card for anybody who had affluence who could buy a house someplace else. Right. So, so we always had unlimited choice, and this was so, I think, compelling. It was, it was frustrating to the, I, I would say, the progressives on the left who, who and, and charter schools originally were, those were Democrat ideas anyway. I mean, they started, right. Ted Coldery in Minnesota was somebody, that we'd looked at what they'd done. A Roy Romer in Colorado had been active right. there. Even Bill Clinton. And sure. one of our finer moments later on is when we, Clinton, some years later, <laughs> were able to have him come to the Michigan legislature right. and deliver a speech. I remember that. And yeah. he's an advocate for charter schools. And here sits all his party members, you know, you know, wanting to chew off their hands because they can't clap for that. They've, they've been fighting, but Clinton's mm-hmm. an advocate. He's there. Mm-hmm. We're, we're putting federal money. We want to have more of these, more schools, more choice. And anyway, it, it, it was a, uh, the, so the speech gets delivered in October, lays out reforms of education right, as right, well right. as a new funding. And, and the proposal that we made is, look, Let's raise the sales tax from four to six percent. Right, and uh, I think we'd put a small hike in the cigarette tax was in there as well, and and to 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 uh, to make this work, we can we come up with the concept of a constitutionally guaranteed foundation grant. Right, right, and that opens the door now to the basically the money following the student. Right, uh, right, and that. That again is very different because uh, school funding was always based on the accident of wealth, right, and right. now it's it's different. And and suddenly the student sort of at least has the the hope that maybe they're coming first now, and that there's right. a competition to serve them. And so this debate plays out. And I think one of the more novel things that emerges because you know the counter then from uh, Democrats and legislature was well. You know, sales tax, we, we argued, well, sales tax, at least we can export some of it to our tourists. Right. We have a lot of tourists here. Um, and, it's, and it's somewhat discretionary, it, you know, but because we left, we left, food wasn't in there, so it wasn't, so it, it removed that, uh, which could be said to be a regressive aspect of that. Yeah. Uh, they want to do the income tax. And well, that's, a, you know, we're going to be at loggerheads there. And so we come up with this idea eventually, which again is somewhat unprecedented. Uh, I'd never seen anything like it before. But the more we thought about it, the more we said we're going to have to take the risk because we, we give we, voters an option. Give the voters what do you a want? Choice. Let the voters an income decide. tax hike or a sales tax. Yeah, hike. and what wasn't on the ballot 
was what had always defeated us in the past, the status quo. The status quo was gone. Mm -hmm. That was not a, you couldn't say, no, I'm going to vote no, because I know they've got a better plan somewhere else. <laughs> and, and that every time we lost to the better plan somewhere else that nobody's shown me yet uh, argument. In this case, we said, look, what we had is no good. It's either going to be A or it's going to be B. Now, to get us to that point, we had to get conservatives in the legislature to vote for a big income tax. And that was actually passed and put into effect and would go into effect unless the ballot proposal passed. And I, for the life of me, we, we, and I, I mean, my argument to the legislators was, look, this is an easy vote. There is no way we're losing this election. <laughs> There's no way. <laughs> you were and, convinced that sales would trump income. Absolutely. We, yeah. we just didn't think that was even a, a close, going to be a close call. As it turned out, we got 70% in virtually... I think 82 of 83 counties, maybe the only place we didn't is Wayne County. Yeah. We didn't get 70%. It yeah. passed there too, but yeah. I mean, we, it was a route. It we, was a We route. won yeah. everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so the sales tax went up, the foundation grant was established, and, and here we are. This is 1994 now. The election happened, Correct. I think it was on St. Patrick's Day of 94, it was, I believe. Yeah. yeah. And um, so here we are now, almost 30 years later. And it's proved to be durable. And, uh, and frankly, we've built off of this now. That foundation grant is almost $10,000 a student. Uh, and when you start thinking about that, that's really, you know, the next, the next um, frontier, perhaps, is, yeah. is probably to almost a completely portable grant that, that students you know, and maybe they'll just be high school to start with. Maybe it'll be everything. But I mean, you're going to you're going to be able to have this parent make this choice and look at a wide array of educational opportunities. Say, I think this is what's best for my child. Uh, and this is what we as a family are going to do. Right. And to me, that will be one of those um, moments when you really, again, then see educational improvement. Right. Uh, at, at a much more rapid rate. All right. Let me mention one other issue going back to the late 80s leading into 90, always has intrigued me. I think you and Dick Posthumus sponsored a bill on emergency managers. For, yes. And, and it was signed into law by Jim Blanchard. And it passed unanimously, almost unanimously. I mean, there are a couple of scattered votes in yes. the House and Senate. And flash forward all these years with all the problems and controversy over how emergency managers have worked in the various cities around Michigan. And then Rick Snyder came in in 2011. He wanted it strengthened to give the executive a little more power. It passed with Democratic opposition by that time. But uh, flashing forward, we've had all sorts of other things happen with it. Uh, 2012, uh, it was on the ballot, and the mm -hmm. people said, uh, okay, let's get rid of this. Uh, and then Snyder and the Republican legislature went back and kind of redid it, and it's still in effect today. What is your thought, just overall, broad, broadly, about whether the idea of an emergency manager is a good thing and the evolution in time over 30 years of what's happened with this issue in Michigan and where Michigan ought to go with it going forward? Well, it's really a very good question and it is something, uh, and I would readily acknowledge that we were uh, not flying blind, but we were, we were going where no one had sort of gone before with the initial approach on emergency manager. And I don't think when we were doing that, that we, we had, um, we certainly didn't have the full understanding of what the authority of a legal manager, of, of an emergency manager could be. Uh, I mean, and, and I would say that the Snyder administration, when they came back to this debate, had the advantage of some, in some cases, court decisions and, and some experience to, to be able to, uh, to, to, to flesh out the authority and the power of the emergency manager more than we did. I mean, it was, a, it was an attempt. They were, the reason there were two laws, I think we had to do one for units of government and we did one for schools. I think there were, that's why I think there were two, because one was in the school code, I think, and the other one general. But um, 
I, I do think that the, you know, I, I believe in local control, but I don't think local control, you know, like I've said in schools, I, I don't think it should include the right to decide that failure is an option. <laughs> you know, we're, mm -hmm. we're in charge and the hell with it. We're going let it, <laughs> let it, to let it burn to the ground. I, mm -hmm. I don't think you can do that, or you, you sh at least I don't think that should be the case, and I don't think if that is the case that, that state government ought to sit silently by and say, well, yeah. They decided it. Well, almost um, every state in the country has some kind of an emergency. Yeah, and I, I don't think statute. we did a, a, a good enough job initially because I don't think we understood, uh, you know, all that probably we should have about. Well, as you understand the way the law is right now, do you um, think it, it's pretty sensible? Or? I, I think so. I mean, I, again, I'm not. I am not familiar. I, I know it was changed, and I, I was, I'm certainly aware and, and obviously aware of the controversies that broke out with yeah. Flint. Yeah. Um, I think some of the emergency oversight of the schools has been good. I, I, would, I would go further uh, with, with school governance probably like, I mean, I, I've felt for a long time the mayor of Detroit ought to be the person in charge of schools in Detroit. I don't think there's anybody that's got a more vested interest than I'd. Mm -hmm. Dennis Archer would not take that when mm -hmm. we were uh, able to give it to him. We, and and we, we probably, I don't know if we would have had the votes, but we probably should have tried to say, I don't care if you want it or not, you have to you take have, it. Because, you have to take it, yeah. Uh, because what we have is, 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 is never really worked very well right. there. Uh, and there's probably other schools where that makes sense. and. And I think you might even say of cities of a size, um, rather than have a school board that's not very accountable, put it under the mayor and make them accountable. And, and it gets to be more important or and easier to do if, if there's a more robust school choice, because then mm -hmm. the mayor will run the school in the city. And if, if they have good schools, people want to come into that city school. If they're not, they're not bound to stay there. Right. So that so right. it, it makes less of a it, it it used to be that the the again that wealth factor that property tax yeah. really tied your hands a little bit now it's not as much it's like a, I don't know it's a city service if you if you will I mean there's yeah. other city services that one can think of and uh, maybe that school ought to be under a mayor um, a lot of a lot of states North Carolina the schools are organized on the county basis. Um, I don't know if that makes sense in a big county, but you know, would, would one school board in Isabella County work for Shepherd, Mount Pleasant, and Beale City? Possibly, <laughs> but I wouldn't, I always said when I was governor, uh, I learned this lesson a long time ago, don't, don't mess with the mascots. We're not gonna, <laughs> we're not gonna force the districts to mm. consolidate, right. but could one superintendent handle three schools in Isabel County for sure. Yeah. You don't you don't you don't need two. Yeah. And let the and let there be local advisory boards that man that right. work there. But 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 mm -hmm. administrative structure, uh, and we, we we're paying for way too much administration these days. Right. And and that should be squeezed out in my right. view. Right. Um it's, let me let me ask yeah. one other issue that was big in the eighties when you were in the Senate and Jim Blanchard was governor, and that is what I'd call corporate welfare. Sure. Uh, the whole idea that the state should have a role in economic development, tax incentives, credits, so forth, or should state government stay out of it and let the private sector deal? And as I remember, I mean, Blanchard tried to develop uh, economic development using tax incentives at the state level. There was pushback by a lot of the legislature, mainly Republicans, I think even you, but then you yeah. became governor. And it was like, uh, wait a second here, uh, you know, there's some well, stuff going on out there. Oh, well, that's fair. Yeah, I so mean, what do you think? The strategic fund was the Blanchard proposal to create the yeah. strategic fund and it passed the Senate. Uh, it was one of about three votes that we lost when I was leader yeah. that we would have preferred not to. Uh, and I think on that one, I think that was Senator DeMasso, maybe Senator Cedarberg joined that one, I'm not sure, but you know, we lost a, we lost a couple of our caucus members and he prevailed um, on that. The, the, 
in those days, that was going to be administered in the Department of Commerce. And um, later on, and, and we, we just, and I, the other thing I should say is, I guess the entry point here is that states do compete uh, for jobs and investment. And, and states do play a role in the competitiveness uh, or, or state policy plays a role in the competitiveness of the state. Uh, grants, you, you, what, what corporate welfare is an interesting phrase because um, you, you, Jim Edgar and I, when we were both first term governors, Jim was from <laughs> Illinois, uh, we talked to some of our colleagues about, look, this, this competition among the states about who can hand out the most money to attract the business is probably not the smartest competition to have. We ought to, comp we ought to be really uh, competing on the quality of the workforce, and we ought to be putting our investments into the things, the infrastructure, mm -hmm. the roads, which not just the company would use, but everybody else gets to drive on too, or put it into the workforce. And those skills are there for not just one company, but for all companies. And so that, that would make more sense. But uh, we were up against southern states, small southern states, who had very attractive uh, incentive packages. And uh, there was just no interest, zero interest in their part in saying we want to do something else because they could cherry pick and, and try to mm -hmm. attract. And they sure. were particularly aggressive in attracting foreign enterprises to come to their states. Oh, and, okay. and that's why you see Germans and Japanese uh, Auto and auto suppliers in places like South Carolina, Kentucky, North Carolina. So they had these programs. We also recognized, I think, that if if that's the game we have to play, the larger states uh, with more resources can play it better. We're bigger, richer, and or we were. Now now that some of that's changing a little bit and has changed a lot, and and also uh, it. it it was my view at the time that a government entity is a very poor kind of decision maker because they're, they're too susceptible to who's putting the pressure on. One of the things that, uh, I'll give two examples that kind of uh, hopefully illustrate this point. Uh, one was a policy that we ended immediately um, about prison locations. What's that to that kind of, it was just, it's just how governments make decisions. There was a there was a mindset that we were going to on the Department of Corrections at the time. They were trying to force. They wanted to have prisons sort of geographically spaced around the state, and you had communities like Ionia that said, "Look, we'll take the prisons. We've, we're used to this. We've got a workforce here that knows how to handle this. We we love that investment. So why would you spend uh, lots of money and a great deal of effort trying to force one into Oakland County where they didn't want it?" as opposed to putting it in Ionia. And so mm -hmm. we said, look, let's, this, this, these are prisons and they're for the protection of the public. They're not for the convenience of the prisoner. <laughs> so we'll put them where, we'll take the path of least resistance mm -hmm. there. So ending that, that kind of attitude. There was also, from an economic development standpoint, this is much more relevant, a policy at the time, well, we're trying to really sell Southeast Michigan and and so here are the sites. Meanwhile, the company's looking at, I don't want to be there, uh, too close to the UAW headquarters, too close to <laughs> whatever, you know. Yeah. It's not where we want to be. Uh, well, we've got a site in Grand Rapids or in Ottawa County. You'd love that site. Oh, show it to us, or Battle Creek, show us. So we, we simply said, look, we're not going to try geographically direct anybody here or there. But I think that's the tendency when, when you get the, the sort of the government agencies trying to make these decisions. That's what led to the development of the Michigan Jobs Commission, which then under Doug Rothwell's very capable leadership, uh, in, you know, morphs into a, a, a Michigan Economic Development Corporation. So sort of pulls it outside of state government, if you will, and gives it some independence, and now it functions truly as a, a promotion agency. And if we can put the jobs in Cass County, if that's where they want to go because that's close to Indiana and it's close to the, uh, the interstate, the toll yeah. road, fine. That's where we'll go. We're not going to try to make put the round peg in the square hole, vice versa. We'll, we'll try to. Right. 
and and I think that that is there's greater justification for that. now what's happened in recent years is the size of these grants have gotten amazing and I and I you know we didn't quite have to confront that but you've seen where Ford takes jobs and goes down south of those they didn't talk to Michigan officials that we we didn't know they were even looking um, and that should never be the case because one thing that uh, Doug Rothwell started and this was fascinating because we found there were a lot of uh, what I'd call non-economic ways to help attract or retain business and one of the most effective ways to to increase the number of jobs in your state is to make absolutely dead certain you're taking care of the people who are here and, and that was the other problem that I had that there there's such a fascination about going out and chasing the new new thing right that you don't look over your shoulder and say what about these guys who've been here for a hundred years <laughs> what are we doing for them and mm -hmm. well they needed a, they needed access to the they needed an all-weather road they needed access to a freeway they needed a rail spur all this stuff well suddenly we went from not really knowing to I think under Doug Rothwell at a peak they were having four to five thousand visits a year with companies businesses the the staff wasn't sitting in office they were on the road knocking on the door and saying look we want to understand your business what are the barriers to growth what are the things that if they happened would make a difference and time and time again we learned it was training for for employees but we also learned about some of these other things it was the utility rate or the uh, or the uh, the fear that they were going to be given an interruptible supply uh, that that could if a you know if there was a particularly hot day or a particularly cold day they might get you know so there there were a hundred little things and by having those communications we learned all that stuff and you know when we got the unemployment rate I think in you know at one point it got down to three point one or three point two percent I mean partially it was just because everything was humming on. Uh, you know at a, at a very high level and we knew exactly what people wanted and we knew if somebody was thinking about 30 new jobs what what were the three factors that were going to determine where those 30 jobs are going to be in you know in St. Clair uh, County or they were going to be in uh, yeah. Ohio yeah and so to me it, it's a mixture and I and I you know I think we concluded that yeah there are times when there are some incentives are going to be necessary but uh, there's a whole lot more jobs going to be created by taking care of the people that are here than you are with that shiny new investment. Right. And some of these shiny new investments, um, you know, blow up too. I mean, look at, I'll use Wisconsin, but they, they made a huge offer to Foxconn for this big plant, but never right. materialized. Right, right. Well, your governorship, 12 years, uh, tied with Soapy Williams, uh, next to Bill Milliken is the longest governorship in the history of Michigan. Uh, so many issues we could touch on. Let me just ask you, what are some of the other ones that you feel uh, are most important and that maybe you're proudest of? I mean, let me just throw out one. What about Detroit Metro Airport, working with Ed Mack? Well, I, that's one that you know happened sort of late uh, along uh, but but I I do count that as significant because that was something where uh, we'd had a good relationship uh, with Ed McNamara and at that time Mike Duggan who was his top aide and and there was a there was a conversation I mean while Ed was the county executive he, he could you know kind of make things happen but as Ed realized he's not going to live forever or be county executive forever. Uh, we're not always going to have a, you know, maybe an executive in the governor's office and in the Wayne County executive's office that are going to be able to talk to each other. And <clears throat> the road commission was not the, the right way to manage a, a major international airport. <laughs> and it was understood that, that in, in this century, air travel pretty darn important and and that meant freight travel and passenger travel and it also meant perhaps related economic development and so the whole idea was how do we how do we assure that Detroit Metro Airport because the the airlines had had lots of complaints about uh, 
you know, some of the requests and some of the behavior of the road commission and and officials appointed by the road commission. Right. So they wanted it. They they would they were very anxious to have change, and so that was a conversation we got together and came up with the authority and talked about how it could work, what would be required. The governor has an appointment on there, uh, you know the the commissioners have an appointment or the the Wayne County Exec has appointments. And now, if you look at that airport, they're constantly improving it, and just the attractiveness of the airport. I mean, they've 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 sort of cleaned up the entrance they're they're cleaning up all of the uh you know kind of the trashy areas it, it's it's looking good and it's functioning right. very well in winning it seems like every year awards a, as uh one of the best airports in the world for travelers and right. passengers and um airlines and it's a huge asset to the state and that was just something that we got done because we were able to work together and put that in place I'll give you another one. It's a Wayne County issue, kind of an interesting one. Uh, and again, it was just one of these that was around for a long time, uh, a bit of a, a relic probably, but Detroit Recorders Court. And I, I heard for, you know, all the time I was, a, when I was a candidate, I heard this a lot running for governor down in Wayne County, how irritated people would be if you lived in Westland or you were down in Trenton and somebody gets arrested for a crime and they go into recorder's court, they say, well, that's nothing, and they're on probation. Uh, and meanwhile, that same crime, maybe in Oakland County, they'd be off, they'd be spending a year in jail or maybe even a prison sentence. But we had a, you had a recorder's court elected by the people of the city of Detroit passing judgment on crimes all over Wayne County. So we simply got rid of the recorder's court, and the fear at the time was, well, gee, does this mean there'll be no more black judges elected? Well, no, in fact, it, it hasn't really had any impact at all. And <clears throat> now you've got one system of justice for the whole county. Well, so th those cases would go to district court or what other well, courts? Well, no, I mean, it was, it, it's now, the, it's a, it's just a circuit court like every other. Circuit court. Yeah, okay. the, the, the Wayne County Circuit Court handles, yeah. you know, civil cases and criminal cases. Yeah, yeah. But now you've got a draw. So the judge, well, you won't just have a Detroit elected judge passing judgment on a, a Y right. and dot case, you know, right. you, you could have somebody from Detroit, you could have somebody from uh, uh, Gross Point. What about uh, environmental cleanup bond issue? Well, uh, again, uh, an area where mm -hmm. I think uh, every governor, I mean, certainly Governor Milliken uh, stressed his, uh, you know, everything from, uh, you know, some of the, uh, you know, we have the, 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 the trust fund that was set up with oil and gas revenues uh, that happened in the Millican years. We did an environmental bond issue, Clean Michigan bonds at the time. <clears throat> we had a couple of goals that were really important there. It was Michigan because we were, were an industrial state early on. We had an awful lot of industry on the waterfronts, but it was, it was also quite clear that in many of these communities, whether it's Muskegon or Detroit, I mean, much of that went to help Detroit, I mean, it was part of, you know, we didn't get a move during the time I was there, but we were starting the process of getting those cement plants off the Detroit River. And now, and we, we did some of the early uh, walk, which now runs all the way from Belle Isle to, uh, you know, you know, south. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know how far it goes, you know, past downtown heading south mm -hmm. toward, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't go to Wyandotte, you down know, but it, but it goes down that, down that waterfront, path. you know. And, you know, you have to look and look at decisions like, you know, I think it was, the, it was the Detroit News. One of them built the printing plant on the riverfront, a printing plant <laughs> with brick in walls on, sitting on the waterfront. What on earth was somebody thinking about that? Um, but in this bond issue, we started saying money for, and really accelerated. I think we did a lot on brownfield cleanup, and that, that's what led to, uh, you know, Bay Harbor being able to be developed, an old uh, quarry, right. suddenly beautiful. But the one other thing is, it's just a small little thing, but it was kind of a, we were always proud of it because Michigan, the state of Michigan is a regulator. We, we tell everybody in the private sector what you can do and what you shouldn't do and what you need to clean up. But we never really looked at what the state uh, situation was and did we have uh, problems 
Well, guess so. Guess what? When we started looking closely, I picked up the cover and looked under there. Here's all these state police posts that had leaking underground storage fuel tanks. Those had to come out, be cleaned up. We were telling the gas station they had to do it, but here we were, or we tell a, a business you had to do it, but we hadn't done it. So we took care of that. Uh, we found that the public health department, once upon a time, had dumped needles and trash out and back in the back 40 because the state had a lot of properties that buried it out there, out of sight, out of mind. We cleaned those things up. One of the most polluted areas, which you can only do so much with, but but Camp Grayling, it was because of all of the armament up there and all of the exercises, mm -hmm. and we're very proud of Camp Grayling, but we had a lot of stuff that we had to clean up there. And so that, that Clean Michigan bond set up site, and we had a fellow, guy named Keith Harrison, went through, and every agency, every department had to go through, and you, is there anything that is a problem? And we tried to identify all of those and, and get those cleaned up. And that was a nice, you know, because if you're going to, you're going to be the regulator you better better look around <laughs> look in your own closet before you you know and, and so that was a, that was a little thing and i i think over the years um and one thing that we probably did maybe i we always said we we don't know what will happen in the future but it served us well is that i was i was blessed with some very talented legal help and uh we we were able to, and I always said I had the view as a legislator that in the legislative branch, we should be robust in the exercise of our powers as the legislative branch. But I had the same view as an executive. Mm -hmm. Executive ought to be robust in exercise of powers. And we, we were able to use the reorganization uh, articles of the Constitution that were put in, and much of that was in the 61-62 Constitution, where in effect what the what the Constitution does is give the governor a legislative power to reorganize state government, right. and it gives the executive veto power to the legislature. If they don't like it, they can turn it down. Mm -hmm. And we use that to, uh, to I think, bring a lot more accountability to state government. One of the areas that um, we actually uh, got to the point, we, 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 we won some recognition, and uh, I, I always, told the people from the Center for Digital Government that they, they gave an award to Granholm like in her first year, but it was really, it was our award, you know, <laughs> because we had created um, a, a department to deal with technology. And, yeah. and, and we had, and it was interesting, I found the same thing when I went to Michigan State for that year as a president there. Um, in state government, it was all decentralized. And we had these different email systems and we got everybody onto the same email system and you know mi.gov uh and and we we started getting rid of all of these different um uh storage locations that were tucked away in different departments some of them not at all secure uh, and really enhancing rather dramatically the the security and the services available through our Department of Information Technology. And uh, John Cost did some amazing work there. And then we had some people come in and, and built upon that. When I got to Michigan State, I think they had 76 different email systems in the university. Wow. We didn't get rid of all of them in the, in the year, but I think we got it down, I think we were down to single digits by the time I left. But you had departments uh, fighting to say, well, we have to keep our own email system. And, <laughs> you, you, why is that? There was a there's a department of like astrophysics or something at Michigan State, and I remember saying, you know, so you have interplanetary communications we don't know about that you have to have a your own system and mm -hmm. and and it was and we had we had very poor security, which I was very concerned was going to lead to, you know, some kind of horrific problem down Hacking. the road. Yeah. So that kind of stuff, and 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 I think over twelve years, I mean. And as we, you know, as we talk about this, there, there's, there's so much. I think one area that we haven't talked about, but it was a combination of federal and state, and I think it, it probably is one of the more interesting accomplishments. And, and unfortunately, in latter years, has been somewhat undone, in part by by federal attitudes that changed, but it. 
we, we mentioned earlier how Bill Clinton came in and, and gave a talk. One of the things he was talking about uh, around that time also was welfare reform. And I had been part of the National Governors Association uh, negotiating team, if you will. There were three Democrat governors, three Republican governors. The three Democrats were Roy Romer uh, from Colorado, um, Governor, Zell, uh, Governor Lawton Childs from Florida, Governor Bob Miller from Nevada. The three Republicans were Tommy Thompson from Wisconsin and Mike Levitt from Utah, both of whom became HHS secretaries, and myself. And so the, the six of us, we, we figured that we probably spent 100 hours face-to-face -face just talking about wow. welfare reform and Medicaid reform. And this all comes to fruition because of Newt Gingrich becoming speaker, and prior to that, he had put out a contract with America, and he talked about welfare reform in there. Right. They had not done any of the, the detail work on what that all meant, but Newt uh, was smart enough to bring in some of the governors and say, look, what do, what do we need to do here? And so we worked on that, and Tommy had been doing things. We'd done a lot of things in Michigan, so we'd kind of been competing back and forth about different approaches. Well, now we could kind of take that to the national level, and other states have been doing some things, but I think we were, Wisconsin and Michigan were kind of viewed at the time as yeah. kind of being out in front. Um, Medicaid was something different because uh, we, we had that on the table, and we were talking, again, this is in... Uh, so this is after 94, so this is 95, 96. And, and the situation was such that Newt's the speaker, Bob Dole's the leader in the Senate, but Bob Dole wants to run for president in 96. So he was pretty amenable, uh, even if he didn't love it, to working with Newt and the governors. I mean, he, he kind of always thought Bob had a little sense about these, these states being these <laughs> <laughs> pretty much subordinate to the mm. federal government. But mm -hmm. anyway, he, Newt, Newt really empowered us. And so he, in the first two bills that went to President Clinton got vetoed because we had Medicaid block grant in there. Yeah. The third one, we finally had to remove it. And then it was signed by Clinton. But it, it empowered us. And it was in that time frame. That, and, and I'd asked Jerry Miller to come back, a, a very familiar name, to Michigan because Jerry had been the budget director under Governor Milliken. He was in Washington heading a National Association of State Budget Directors. And I said, w would you come back? And what I'd like you to think about is, would you run the Department of Social Services? And Jerry's a, an amazingly compassionate and smart individual. He, yeah. He'd worked for uh, Lockheed Martin. He'd actually done workforce stuff for them and in, in systems. But he, he also, he and Sharon, you know, he they've had in their own family children with special needs. And right. they, they've really a wonderful individual. And, and he really cared about, you know, family empowerment. That's where ultimately the name, the Family Independence Agency, because we said we're really not, we're not, what is our purpose? Our purpose is to help families become independent. Right. And right. so we changed the name of the agency. And all of a sudden, people have been there for years. And I would say some maybe a bit cynical about what that job was. Mm -hmm because Jerry was trying to liberate them from the paperwork and the, and the mm -hmm. drudgery of, of what these systems were demanding right. and, and, and get them back interacting with people. Well, we started this Project Zero. And what, what was that? Well, that was an idea to say, look, uh, if we view welfare as transition, how do we help somebody who's, for, for whatever reason, you know, has been unable to fully support themselves and their family. How do we help them move back? And the common sense stuff, one of the first things that we got done, it used to be if you went to work, you immediately lost money because you <laughs> take it away. And so why, why does that make any sense? We, we want people to work and we think the work experience is a, is a good thing. And if you start working a little bit, you may wish or find yourself able to work even more and there's no question if you work more, you're going to have more income than if you stay on uh, right. public assistance. So we said the first $200, you keep it all. So obviously, any work immediately paid, and then it, it continued to pay along the way. Yeah. And the idea was to get everybody doing something, even if that something, if it wasn't for pay, maybe it was in a training program, maybe it was in a volunteer, but, but to create activity. 
Well, we had county after county that was achieving that goal. They were, because now suddenly the people working for the state are saying, okay, what's the need? Is it, is it transportation? Is it proper clothing? Is it, is it a child care need? What, what's going on that represents barriers? How do we remove the barriers? How do we enlist others in the community to help? And Jerry did a marvelous job with that. And so we saw historic low numbers on public assistance. When the, uh, later on, when the Obama administration comes, uh, they start to change all that stuff. And so now you have a situation where it almost doesn't seem, no matter how low the unemployment rate goes, the food stamp participation still stays sky high. And mm -hmm. they've, they've changed a lot of these things. But, but I still think uh, for, for the country that, that this, uh, this needs to be a priority for governors out there right, to look right. at how you help people Right. Take charge of their own lives. Well, even before 95 and 96 and Clinton and Gingrich, uh, you kind of kick-started that in Michigan in 91 with uh, general, assistance. general assistance welfare, 75,000, you said, gone. That was an early well, controversy. Well, you know, 35 other states had never had that. Pro well, if they had yeah. it, they certainly didn't have it at the time. Yeah. We were looking at a deficit in the state budget of nearly, I don't know, 800 or so million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. We said, well, look, Here's one thing: understand, we're not raising taxes, so let's let's start figuring this thing out. Well, one of the programs we looked at was that one, and and this was understand who the population was: single, able-bodied adults. And by able-bodied, we meant, uh, you know, I mean that doesn't mean they're, they have aches and pains or you know some yeah. issues, but they were able to work, yeah. and there were no children there, yeah. so they wasn't they weren't home because of child care or right. something else. It was just a payment being made. One of the things that we found out is when we eliminated that, some, it was, it was, you're right, I mean, that number 65, 70,000 people, yeah. a third never showed up anywhere again. So we, we had to conclude <laughs> we probably had a tiny bit of fraud in the program. Uh, others, uh, it, it was amazing because it, and you haven't heard now in 15 years, I haven't heard anybody come forward and say, oh, we will put that program yeah. back. No. No. Um, and, and I think it was a terrible program, and and it. I re, this was also led to another innovation, which I, I, again, I don't know where it is today, but you know the the press were, were you know were somewhat hysterical, or at least they were, <laughs> or they were as usual. Well, <laughs> sometimes for sure. And anyway, there was all of this. Well, what's going to happen when winter comes? But that's when Jerry Miller uh, came with uh, uh, Clarence Harvey, who was the head of the Salvation Army in the state at the time, and said, look, let's, the Salvation Army's been doing this for a century. Let's enter into an arrangement whereby you know, we work together. If there's, if there's someone who is homeless, someone who's truly at risk, we can connect them with the Army. We'll, we'll have a contract. And so that's what we did. And, and so the press, you know, would now, if they were to find someone, their obligation is to help them connect to the army. Don't don't come to me because we've got a we've got a way to deal with this. Please, if, you, if you're saying we've found Mr. Jones here and he's on this grate and it's going to be ten below tonight, well, did you call the army? They will come. You know, I mean, this is why they're there. This is what this purpose is. It's not. We have a plan. It's not that we're going to let Mr. Jones freeze here. Um, and I think that that led to some interesting stories because we would have people who would say, well, I'm not going to the Salvation Army because the no alcohol policy or I'm expected to work. <laughs> you know, I'm not. And you're in the public you would have a lot of questions about that. Well, wait a minute. I mean, if we're... <laughs> I'm sorry. What what is going on here? You you won't go to this shelter because, you you know. And so I think we we we, we got through that uh, with I think a an approach that I think I think was helpful to people and it also hopefully helped people get back. I mean, we still got sighted. We got a lot of challenges. They're there today. Uh, uh, I I do believe you know coming back to education that that one of the great challenges in education today is to, is to, is to have a better result 
uh, we, we cannot have a system where children after four years in school aren't proficient in reading. How is that even possible? How is that tolerable? How can we accept that? Uh, I don't think we can. Uh, COVID is giving us a big learning gap that has to be closed. But beyond that, we had learning gaps among school districts too, and that, that needs to be addressed. When I look at 12 years, I mean, we, we, we've got an awful lot that we can point to where we, you know, we, we got the state, when I left, we, got the, we had the AAA bond rating back. Right. It was 25 years since Michigan had AAA bond rating. And so well, what's that matter? That's just a number, but it's a number that makes the cost of borrowing for every unit of government. Everybody in the state, in a public entity, it's, it's cheaper because of that. Yeah. And that's just good management. And, yeah. and uh, it lasted about a year before the Grand Administration lost it. And, and they kind of like, well, okay, it's gone. But it was kind of a big deal. I mean, a lot of states think that's, that's really important to have. And What about the public health laboratory? That's a good story. That's, that's, that's one of those. And let's put the accident fund with it because there's two privatizations. There were other things that we tried to move out of state government. But the public health laboratory, I'll start with that one first, although it, it did come second. We were one of two states, I think, and we we thought we were on the path to be the last state that actually had, years ago, all states had public health laboratories. That was just something that was done, but that over the years became, I guess, pretty inefficient and, you know, drug companies and others took over a lot of that responsibility. Part of the federal government maybe took over some of it, but Michigan still had one. We were, we were the largest producer of the anthrax vaccine. We, we did that for when troops were in the Middle East, there was a threat that anthrax might be used by, I don't know if it's Saddam Hussein or by, you know, yeah. evil forces, wherever they might be. We, we were the, we were the producer. Um, we had a colony of uh, monkeys. Uh, nobody, very few people knew really? that. I don't think legislators. <laughs> you know, we're not talking about the legislature either. <laughs> you know, we're, we're talking about actual monkeys. Okay, all we right. sold those off. I think somebody in Texas bought those. This is all out on North Logan, out, out really? by the airport. Oh my God! And and um, this lab, uh, we have some dedicated people there, but we were just we were we were going to be. Uh, we couldn't afford to make the upgrades that were going to be needed. Uh, obviously, the requirements have gotten a lot tougher um, in terms of you know what you have to do to manage a lab, and and it was going to be a losing proposition. So we started saying, what what can we do, and uh, is there is there a value to this? And in this case, the value was maybe de minimis. It wasn't somebody was going to pay a lot for this, but but we knew those employees would be out of jobs. I mean, those were some pretty good jobs. Yeah. We had some pretty smart scientists there, excellent director of the lab, but Denny Shornack took this project on and Jim Haveman and by golly, over a period of time, over the unbelievable unrelenting opposition of Ling Brewer, a state representative from Eam that. County, mm -hmm. just was, I mean, he couldn't understand I don't think he understood what was going on out there, but he sure couldn't understand what we were trying to explain, that the jobs are going to go away, this will close. Is there something we can do to help? Well, what emerges from all of this is a, a sale to a private entity. One of the key guys in this is a former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Bill Crow, and, yeah. and, and this, this company, the lab is acquired. Now it's been through a couple of iterations, but I believe today we have this brand new facility that's out there. I, I'm sure there's more than a thousand employees there now. So it's, wow. it's grown by leaps and bounds. And wow. um, when we got into it, we even found in the deep freezers there, some, <laughs> Denny Shornick was telling me about this, some pretty uh, amazing and, <laughs> wrong things to have in the freezer, you know, that they, they, so all this stuff got, I mean, it's, you know, I, I don't, you, like you just what? never, uh, like what? well, maybe like, maybe a little smallpox or something in there, you know, <laughs> <laughs> there was, there was stuff, I, 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 I should be very careful because I, I don't okay. know personally, right. but I mean, it was just like, are you kidding? What's, what's down in there, you know, mm -hmm. 
but all that stuff's been cleaned up. It's all it's just spick and span. It's a sparkly new 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 a yeah. lot of new investment out there, yeah. and some very good jobs now, from my understanding. But so you what talk about, about what about the accident? Fund? Well, the accident fund was a state agency or a state uh, operated workers' compensation fund, a very well run, well regarded, but. But here it is, uh, it's part of state government. Well, there's no rationale for that to have to be in state government. Obviously, there's plenty of private sector companies out there. And wasn't, but, wasn't there some controversy over time whether it really was a full part of well, state government? Well, there was government? a debate, you know, I mean, but, but clearly the employees were state employees yeah. at the time, and they were getting, uh, they were in the state. Uh, Pension system, I believe. I mean, so it was, it, it, it's the old looks like, walks like, quacks like, it probably <laughs> is a duck, you know. So uh, we said, what can we do? And here, the idea was, well, first of all, we thought we could uh, realize some money from the sale of it, but we also thought it would be a better, uh, uh, again, a, a stability or a stabilizing for the people who work there and that they could have a bright future. So this was a long involved process. We had to use some pretty uh, talented outside counsel on this, but we ended up, I think the Barclays, which is an international company, was hired to market yeah. this. And we thought Michigan's had long a, a uh, We've been an entry point for foreign companies, particularly Canadians, insurance companies come into the U.S. market. They have to come in and be regulated somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so the Michigan Insurance Bureau always had that expertise and we were the support of entry. We thought somebody certainly will see this as an opportunity working with experienced Michigan regulators to acquire the accident fund and maybe begin to build out a book of business. Mm -hmm. Turned out that really wasn't the case. We didn't attract uh, the foreign companies. They didn't come in. But, uh, and, and then none of the domestic Mich Michigan companies decided they didn't want to bid on it. Mm -hmm. It ends up Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, smartly, mm -hmm. figures this thing out. Mm -hmm. And they, I think their winning bid was like $250 million to acquire the X fund. Now at the time, that is the largest privatization of a government asset in the country. Really? Yeah, it was, nothing had ever been wow. over a billion dollars. Yeah. But we got the check and they got the accident fund. Today, the accident fund is one of the most profitable aspects of Blue Cross Blue Shield. It has grown dramatically and it is a business that will continue to grow. And even those who might have said, well, I don't know if the Blues can run anything. Well, this they have built and managed very, very effectively. And so uh, I don't, again, don't know how many employees are now there, but it's headquartered in downtown Lansing. It's about one of the only things that's in downtown Lansing, it seems like. But that's doing very well, and, and the state got paid. And so those are the kinds of things. And I think we probably, we have to look, I mean, there may well be other aspects of state government where, where there, there might be some opportunities. I don't, I don't know. Um, this is part of the, you know, being gone a number of years now. Uh, I've not kept up, and are there are there things, and 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 the world is different. So there may be things that we didn't look at yeah. in the past that now you could look at in the future. Sure. There's also, in my view, an opportunity to be creative if we ever get a, the right partner in Washington, the federal government. We have three national forests in Michigan. I'm convinced that the Michigan Department of Natural Resources could run those forests and manage them better than the U.S. Forest Service, because. I mean, if you look at how much land out west is federally owned, I, I suspect our three national forests, I'm like the Manistee, you know, we're probably a little bit of an afterthought in, in the world of mm -hmm. the U.S. Forest Service. But, boy, if you put Michigan's Department of Natural Resources in, and I've always said in Washington, we'll take 90% of what you spend, <laughs> we'll improve the management, and we'll put money in our pocket, yeah. you know. It was a Mackinac Island, once a national park. Yes, it and was. became a state park. Yes, it was. And that's I think a, the state that's is very good recall. It pretty well. Yeah, right? 100 plus years ago. Yeah, yeah exactly. that's exactly what happened there. So uh, we've done well with our underseas parks. Uh, that's kind of something that's kind of, I mean, that that was, again, a Denny Shornack, one of those talented guys who 
had a lot of capacity to do different things. That was something he worked on. We created those parks to protect some of that. What about Amtrak? Amtrak. Uh, that I don't know much about. I know there's been a, you know, uh, uh, I think there still is probably some state support for the Amtrak route that runs what port here on Chicago, but uh, I, I that I that I would that, confess that, I'm okay. not. Is not there anything on... else that you can think of right now um, during your tenure that we haven't talked about that you think is worth discussing or bringing up? Um, there are probably lots of things that <laughs> people would like to ask or maybe wish on. I would talk about. Um, I would say that um, the one thing that we got done that is um, a bit of a, uh, it's a huge gift to taxpayers prospectively because it, it took care of a, of a major, major problem and that is the changes that were made in the public uh, employees retirement system because uh, yeah. if you look at Michigan's indebtedness now compared to other states, mm -hmm. it's, it's a fraction of what some of these states face. There are states that are going to absolutely struggle, and especially as we tape this, you know, the U.S. economy probably is headed toward a recessionary period, or it looks like it's about to tip in the inflation numbers. Uh, continue to be unacceptably high, and that's causing all kinds of consequences. But we were able to close off the old defined benefits system. The people were in it could stay in, but, but prospectively new hires came into a defined contribution program, and that meant from day one they could begin to accumulate some savings for the retirement. When we looked at the retirement system, over half the people that had ever joined uh, ever qualified because it, they, their stay in state government often fell below 10 years and if they left at nine and a half years they got nothing so we, we fixed that and um, for it, it made it a much more portable personal system and we we failed at the time by two votes to have the same reforms put in place for the public school retirement mm -hmm. system now they've now, Governor Snyder, I think in the past, they, they've made a number of changes. I am not able to speak to what they've accomplished there, but I do know for the state system, tr tremendous change uh, mm -hmm. there. And, um, and we think that it probably put us on a much more sustainable, mm -hmm. I, well, we know it did. I mean, the, the numbers are stunning. Doug Roberts considers that to be one of the things he's most proud of is right. getting getting that done, that, and he played a big role, obviously, in Proposal A in the school finance reform, but, but Doug looks at that and he said, this is something that sets us apart from, right. and we were the first state. Brooks uh, Patterson, when he was Oakland County Executive, was, I think, the first county to move in this direction, but, right. but the state of Michigan is there, and I mean, what Illinois or New York, California would give would be right. incalculable to have something like our system what about judicial appointments, particularly to the state Supreme Court? Well, uh, again, an area that I, I think the stewardship was was good, and we we my my philosophy, and I this is really formed by years in the legislature, having sort of been on the losing end of these uh, kind of uh, issues. I, I can't tell you there there were there were multiple occasions where. And, and one in the Millican years, there was this big, what was called the honorable compromise when there was a, a deal struck about increasing, uh, in this case, it was uh, workers' compensation payments, but at the same time reining in some of the uh, court decisions which had allowed for, oh, somebody, somebody takes a, leaves, leaves at noon, goes and drinks their lunch, is impaired, and then comes back and, you know, is, is involved in some accident that their fault because of their drinking, but that's determined to be on the job injury because, you know, they were, well, they were actually at work, you know, they came into work <laughs> in the morning. I mean, this kind of stuff. Or, or, or decisions that took uh, somebody and said, well, there's a, 
mental disability for, uh, in, in some cases that got to be pretty extreme examples uh, or pretty far removed from the workplace. And so you, you, you know, so the idea was, look, let's, let's, let's get the comp system back to really trying to help people get injured yeah. on the job. And for those people, we ought to do more for them. There ought to be a bigger payment. Well, of course, the bigger payments were allowed, but all the reforms got thrown out by the court. And so you, you end up, you say, well, what's this compromise here? I, you know, everything I wanted is gone, and all of the benefits and the costs, they've gone up. And, uh, and so I always argued that it was important to have a rule of law court. And what, what does that mean? I, to me, a rule of law court is one that understands it's a judicial branch, not the legislative branch. And we used to have a couple of former governors on that Supreme Court, and they kind of thought at times I think they were <laughs> still in the executive branch or <laughs> even in, in one case the legislature because one had come from the legislature. But <laughs> I said, you know, you, 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 the legislature gets the, to write the laws, but once we decide, then that ought to be governing, not mm -hmm. uh, uh, having a judicial body. So, well, gosh, if I'd been legislature, I wouldn't have written that law. Well, that's you know, said run for the legislature, <laughs> you know, but don't, 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 mm -hmm. don't take a, mm -hmm. you don't get a second bite of this thing over there just because you're on the bench and wearing a right. robe. Right. And, and one of the things I was so pleased to see, and you, you see this over time, is that once the law is settled, uh, you know, once, and, and the court even had to, I remember hearing Justice Taylor talk about the court having to you know, the cause of or a cause of, the difference between the and a. I mean, they were confused on that. The court cleaned that stuff up. And all of a sudden, the caseloads dropped dramatically because now a lawyer could actually read something. If this is what the plain English said, that was what the court was gonna. Right. The court may say, well, maybe it shouldn't say that. Maybe somebody ought to amend the law, but this is what it says. And that to me is a, and so we had something like a reduction of more than one third of the number of appeals because people could, it is the law. Right. And, uh, and that to me is what, and to follow the constitution. And, and we found ourselves repeatedly having uh, cases lost in the AIM circuit because we had a uh, kind of a crazy circuit here with people like Giddings and Colette <laughs> and, and now they're gone. I don't, I don't know what it's like now, but the other thing we did is also change uh, this. We didn't get done while I was here, but it got done shortly thereafter, was to have the Court of Appeals because they ended up with enough extra time. So now they sit on a rotating basis as the Court of Claims. Right. And they come from all over the state versus having the Ingham Circuit always be the Court of Claims. And given the the political disposition of the Ingham Circuit, you almost always assured a loss before mm -hmm. then had to go to the Court of Appeals. And so that's, that, that, that reform has worked uh, wonderfully well. Well, let's close this out by going back to the campaign trail okay. and talk about your last two campaigns, 1994 uh, and 98. And by the way, you are, as far as I know, the only person in Michigan history since World War II who's knocked off for state office on a partisan basis, four incumbents, three of your own party and one from the opposition, the Democrats in 68, 72, 78, and 1990. But then we go to 94, and this is after Proposal A passes, and uh, you're running for a second full four-year term. And then in 78, you're running uh, another last time. And there was some debate uh, leading up to that, as I remember, about whether you'd run again. I mean. There was. I, I had not decided. Uh, Michelle and I, you know, the girls, our daughters were born November 13th of 94. So they were born uh, five days, I think it was, after the election. Dan Pro always argued he wanted to, he was hoping to have the births earlier and have one in each media market. But. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good line. Michelle didn't appreciate it very much, but she was just she just wanted the birth over with. She mm -hmm. was she was ready, but uh, that was Howard Wolpe in that campaign. Um, it was a, it was a, it was a fine campaign, but it was because of the success of uh, Proposal A. Uh, I mean, our 
numbers went up over 60 percent and it was a pretty easy campaign and it was a uh, nationally also, a huge republican year yeah we had a very good yeah. year uh because obviously it was the you know had the good fortune to be running in the you know it was bill clinton's midterm, mid-term yeah of his first term um and we we did we did well in the legislature we did well spencer abraham was elected yeah the united states senate that yeah. year um so we did very well and it was a it was a it was a pretty easy campaign in in many respects and uh, then 98 uh we were just running against a crazy person a guy named <laughs> jeffrey feiger uh and but you and had to make up your mind to run in the first I, place i did uh, it it and we kind of it was it was yeah you know, I, I wasn't sure in that one um in in 96, I'd had a couple of conversations with Bob Dole about, you know, he was looking for a running mate at the time. And, um, but when he, he brought me down for this, the, we had the second interview and it was really down to three people. I guess I was the last governor standing, but then they had, uh, as it turned out, it was Connie Mack in the U S Senate was some of the last right. Senate I remember and that. then Jack Kemp. And Jack Kemp yeah. And, and once, I'd heard that Jack was, you know, his name, uh, you know, the, I didn't think it was, he would have, I would have been third in that field of three because he was, Dole never had a, a lot of affection for governors to be blunt. Yeah, uh, I mean, he didn't he, think that much of the state. He didn't really think that much. <laughs> they were kind of a nuisance, you know, Yeah. which was so odd because here's the man who carried the, he kept pulling that Tenth Amendment card yeah, out, yeah, you know. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. Well, okay, what about the Tenth Amendment? Yeah. You know, it's, that's us, you know. Yeah. But uh, I thought Kemp was an excellent choice for him, and Jack was a happy warrior, and I yeah. love Jack. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so that we went through that. That convention was out in San Diego. I remember the girls all, you know, the girls were pretty little at that time. There's three, but we go out there. Well, I guess they, you know, they were going to turn four later in the year in 98. Uh, and I'm sorry, in '96 they were only they were only two. They two, go out yeah. to the convention, yeah. and uh, they were the, they were the hit out in San Diego. We had a, we had a, a good convention, but I came back and <clears throat> I wasn't sure. And then, but, but then we Michelle and I we talked about in part they were so young, and uh, we thought you know if we do one more we could, you know I'm not sure, but gosh it would. You know they'll really remember they'll they'll have some experiences that might stick with them and mm-hmm. and that did turn out to be the case plus i thought michelle ought to have to go through a campaign you know we weren't married the first time in 90. 94 she was pregnant so she missed that oh, one so I in 98 see. she finally did a little so you almost did it for family reasons family reasons yeah well, wow. I mean, let, let her let her work in the campaign but let the girls get some experience and they they did their fondest memories are of michigan and really really that last term kind of getting a chance to go up to Mackinac and and we also knew that would be the last term and it gave me time um there was some to get ready business. for departure we had yeah. a archivist come in Gleaves Whitney oversaw that and so we we had all the papers organized so they went down to the Bentley library where most of the governor's papers have gone so it was it was kind of an easy transition <clears throat> and it gave me a chance I I wasn't sure where I was going to go, and I ended up throughout going out to Washington, and um, I had one opportunity to stay in the state, another one to, uh, initially I went to work as a, as I was vice president for uh, EDS, right. and I had the responsibility, well, actually, actually I was, my technical term was president of state and local government, so I had all of, about a $1.3 billion uh, P&L on the, a lot of the Medicaid management systems, a lot of technology. So I enjoyed that, but then uh, Dick Dowk from American Axel in Detroit came and said, look, uh, the fellow who heads the National Association of Manufacturers is gonna retire, we'd like you to think about coming over there. And, and that gave me a chance really to kind of put some of the policy interests I had together with an opportunity to run sure. a major association. So. I did that and then ran the business roundtable after that. Each yeah. of us for about seven years, six, seven years. Yeah. And so well, you mentioned you mentioned EDS. What about Ross Perot? He was already gone. Was uh, he? he was he was uh, he had sold the company. Remember, he he had this 
uh, interesting man, lots of interesting stories. I, I never, <laughs> never met Ross Perot. I was, <laughs> okay. I was, I, I certainly was sitting out in, at Michigan State in the Wharton Center that year that there was a debate between, yeah. and, and that was the Clinton, regrettable debate. Clinton, where they, Bush, they, and Perot, yeah, where and, and Bush looked at his watch. He, he looked at his watch. He wasn't really, he wasn't as though he was bored, but he, everybody, they, they, they blew him up like he was, you know, it was, it was terrible. It was but not a good move. No, and, <laughs> you know, Perot cost him that election. I mean, there's no yeah. question about that. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, and it, 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 it reminds one of how unfair things can be at times because if you remember Clinton was, you know, the Carville and Stephanopoulos team that was there yeah. with him. Yeah. They kept saying, well, the economy is stupid. In the fourth quarter of 1992, GDP growth was 4.4% plus, but, but the communication skills of the Bush campaign uh, were just abysmal. And, yeah. and I remember we finally somewhat involved in that campaign just pleading because Bob Teeter was uh, with us then and yeah. Bob was very deeply involved. Yeah. Please give the economic speech. And he gave the major economic address was at the Detroit Economic Club that year. Right. But it came very late. And the image of Dick Darman and Nick Brady were such that and, and, and if yeah. had he made a change in the spring in those roles, but he's so loyal. He mm-hmm. was George Bush George H. A wonderful, wonderful man. He just, yeah. he, he, you know, he wasn't going to do that. He yeah. wasn't, and and so it, he ended up riding that to the bottom. And yeah. um, and yeah. I mean, history is going to be very kind to him because his management of the end of the Cold War, that whole transition yes. period, is yeah. pretty pretty impressive. But yeah, uh, I, I I really felt ninety four night. You know, in ninety eight we improved our percentage again. So we had three elections in a row where our percentage went up each time. And Dick Postumus, by that time in the third term, was lieutenant governor, ran for governor against uh, Jennifer Granholm, and had a, had a very clear uh, shot at it. I mean, it was a close, he did. much closer than people remember it being. It's only four points. Yeah. And, and if he got money early, I think he would have won. I, I think that's right. Because um, the Republicans did well all the rest of the ticket. Yeah, that, well, Mike Cox won the AG's office that year. Absolutely. And, and, you know, as Dick... And, and, and Terry Lynn Land won. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, it was a great year in the legislature, you know. No, it was, it was, it was, it was unfortunate. And uh, that's just, the, those things will happen. And it's, 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 um, the interesting thing is Grant Holmes should, she's an accidental governor anyway, because had, had John Smetanka been, uh, not nominated in 1988 to run for attorney general and Scott, had Romney. Scott Romney, yeah. Granholm never would have won and never would be the nation's energy secretary. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, anyway, maybe I'll, better, I'll leave it there. Let's leave the interview I'll that leave that way. alone. Thank I'll, you I very go much, Governor Bill, John Bill, thank Andrew. you very much. It's, it's been, been a joy. And, uh, fantastic. You know, we'll, if we need to do a chapter two someday, we'll, we'll do that. But this has been a lot of fun. This has been great. Thank you very much. You're very welcome.